Good morning, everybody. It is Tuesday, March 28th. Welcome to the Montgomery County Council. We have two presentations before we get to general business. And the first is a proclamation recognizing mom and pop business day. And that will be presented by council members Sales and Balcom. And they will be joined by the Chief Administrative Officer, Rich Maddalena. So good morning, everyone. I just want to invite a few of the businesses that we invited to come on down to join Council Member Balcom and myself. So we have invited the New Hampshire Car Wash. We also have Gillies. Black Lion Cafe, DMV Empanadas, New Fortune, and Mykonos Grill. All right. Okay. Now we'll get started. Yes. Um, so mom and pop businesses um, have been around for years. They're passed on through generations and that's what makes them so unique to our community and our economy. And so as members of the Economic Development Committee, we wanted to highlight some of the businesses that have that staying power um, that are ensuring that their legacy lives on generation after generation. And that only helps our community when our businesses have a place where they can grow and thrive in Montgomery County. And so I'm going to invite uh, Councilmember Balcom to share a few remarks before we present our first proclamation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And I want to thank Councilmember Sales for uh, bringing Mom and Pop Day to Montgomery County. I've had the great pleasure for the past 20 years or so to work with so many small businesses, uh, many mom and pops, many single entrepreneurs, and small businesses really are the backbone of Montgomery County. They're the backbone of the country. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity to just thank our small businesses for continuing to bring um, goods and services to Montgomery County. So thank you. And now we will hear from the county executive's representative, our chief administrative officer, Rich Maddaleno. Thank you very much, Council Member Sales, Council Member Balcom, Rich Maddaleno here for County Executive Mark Elridge, who together with um, Council Member Natalie Fanny Gonzalez are in Taipei, Taiwan right now, where they're trying to recruit businesses to come to Montgomery County because as everyone knows, Montgomery County is a global center of excellence in the life sciences, in the hospitality industry, and a growing spot for international companies to place their United States headquarters. So that's why the executive and the council member are there with a delegation of business leaders trying to recruit more businesses to Montgomery County. As you heard from the council members, um, small businesses are critically important to this county. That's why the county executive and the council um, four years ago actually launched the very first business assistance program during COVID. Before we had any state, uh, federal funds, state funds, we used our own dollars to backstop small businesses that were dealing with COVID. Um, the executive wants to thank especially council member Friedson for his work together with us on pulling that public health emergency grant program together. Um, this year, the executive is thrilled to launch a new business center. Um, with the collaboration of the county council, we've been able to bring together a group of leaders um, into the county government who are specifically there to help small businesses navigate today's environment, whether it's um, dealing with tax policy, finding locations, finding assistance, dealing with cybersecurity. Believe it or not, your county government is here to help small businesses navigate the world of the 21st century. We are thrilled to have Gene Smith and Nadia Klute, who are both here as part of the business center. 
Um, as the council members know, Gene Smith used to help you uh, analyze revenues, and now Gene Smith is out there actually trying to find revenues um, for the county government, and we're thrilled to have them and a team of professionals there to help businesses. So um, it's my honor to be here with the council members and to re represent County Executive Elrich in support of Mom and Pop Business Day. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. And now we have a few of our businesses that we want to invite to share a few brief remarks before we start the proclamation. And first, we're going to start with the owner of the New Hampshire Car Wash. Come on, Paul. Thank you very much. The only thing I say is that I was very happy and very happy to be here to receive this proclamation. And it's meant to me that I will improve my business and better serve to the customers in Moore County. That's all I can say. I'm very happy. Um, I want to uh, introduce the, the mom and pop from locals. <laughs> Dave and Sandy. Dave's going to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Um, I uh, oftentimes I, I either say too much or say the wrong thing, so I'm going to just try to get both of those out of the way real quick. Um, <laughs> I think we're here mostly because we started a business with a different model, and I think the county lent itself to that. Um, our model wasn't to to have a business and make makes make a profit. It was to build a place for the community. So sort of, what's the saying? Uh, don't ask what you can do for your community, you know? Or, yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, we built it as, as, as a place, not a restaurant, not a bakery, as anything. And, you know, I think because it comes from the heart, it, it, it catches on and it's it's viable um, you know so you go into something because you love it and and do it do it do it well um, I just wanted to say the other reason we're here is because some of these people up here actually noticed it and that means that they're also doing what they like you know uh, they're out in the community they're looking around um, at what works and they spotted us, uh, some more than others. But, um, you know, hopefully you're going to see me here next year because we have another project going on in the town of Poolsville. It's, it's Riverworks Art Center, um, and it is built on the same idea. It's, it's, it's built to elevate the community and to be out there for people. Um, and I think that does come around to, to business. It's all part of the same thing. So thank you anyway. Um, that's it. Thank you, Dave and Sandy. And, you know, he's being very humble because during the pandemic, when we talk about farm to food bank, um, Locals was one of the farms that was feeding our county wide. And so we want to thank them for their ongoing service to the community. Now we're going to have Miguel from DMV Empanadas join us. To say a few brief remarks. Uh, hello. It's kind of weird being the youngest person here in front. Thank you for having us here. We're so happy that we can be at your table yeah, like whenever you have us. And like he said, it's happy that some people recognize us being from the Latin community. Uh, I don't know. Thank you so much. Did we have any more mom and pop businesses here today? Okay. All right, so I'm going to have Council Member Balcom join me. We're going to read the proclamations for our esteemed guests. Whereas Mom and Pop Business Day was founded in 1939 in Boston, Massachusetts by Margie and Rick Siegel, 
who wanted to honor the growth of their parents' dress shop from the ground up despite tumultuous economic conditions and whereas mom and pop businesses signify a core aspect of the American dream, particularly for immigrant families who come to America in search of increased access to economic opportunity and mobility and whereas mom and pop business owners support the community, make shopping more personal, and provide a unique experience to consumers with fresh, innovative ideas in the marketplace and... Whereas more than 95% of businesses located in Montgomery County have fewer than 50 employees, there are 27,498 employer establishments and 118,612 non-employer establishments located in the, in the county, with many being self or family run businesses and? Whereas the Montgomery County Council and the newly formed Economic Development Committee are dedicated to assisting mom and pop businesses through grant funding, training, and education courses, streamline regulatory processes, business funding and incentives and much more and whereas the county executives business center assists mom and pop businesses to start and grow in the county by helping them navigate county processes and connecting them with the numerous resources available through the county and Whereas mom and pop businesses have remained incredibly resilient throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, and they deserve to have our county's full support as an integral function of the local economy. Now, therefore, be it resolved that County Executive Mark Elrich, Council Members Lori Ann Sales, and Marilyn Balcombe, and the entire Montgomery County Council of Maryland hereby recognize Mom and Pop Business Day in Montgomery County. As an important day in our county, signed this 28th day of March in the year 2023 by myself, Councilmember Balcombe, and County Executive Elrich. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much for that proclamation. A great way to start the day. And as we know, our business owners got to get back to business. So thank you for spending your morning with us. Uh, next, we will have a proclamation recognizing the Montgomery County's Meals on Wheels program, and that will be by Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And if the people from Meals on Wheels are here, I understand they were somewhere. Well, if you can come on down, please. very much for all that you do. Meals on Wheels uh, delivers meals to homebound clients, uh, mostly seniors in Montgomery County. Uh, the number of senior residents aged 65 or older in Montgomery County is projected to be more than double between 2010 and 2040 from 120,000 to 244,000 people. Seniors are the fastest growing population in Montgomery County, and with age, they lose the ability to cook, care, and drive for themselves. Unable to perform these essential daily tasks, seniors can face malnutrition, a loss of independence, and a lack of human connection. Moreover, there is a high correlation between access to grocery stores and healthy diets, which can impact seniors without transportation. Last week, I had the privilege, and I'm going to underline the word privilege, of they, it, it, what's written here it says I'm volunteered. I sat in the back seat as the people who did volunteer actually did the work. But with Rockville Meals on Wheels to deliver meals to residents in District 3 and a little beyond, it was an interesting and truthfully told an eye-opening experience that gave me the opportunity to visit with several people, some of whom I hadn't seen in a while, and it was fun seeing them receiving meal deliveries. We're very thankful for the various Meals on Wheels programs for our county, and the the uh, I'd like to have everyone who is here to introduce themselves and if they had something to say, please. I'm Stephanie Archer Smith. I'm with Meals on Wheels of Central Maryland, and we are so grateful to be here today. We have seen how important nutrition is to healthy aging, but um, isolation and human contact is equally important, and we saw that all too well during the pandemic. And Meals on Wheels programs have been a reliable provider of both of those things for more than 60 years. So we're very grateful to be here. Thank you. Please, go introduce yourself. Hi, good morning. My name is Cindy Majane, and I run Meals on Wheels of Germantown. I started doing that a long time ago. Well, I volunteered probably about 27 years ago. And after a couple years, I went to a meeting to say I can't do it anymore and I wound up president. So here we are, <laughs> still president. Um, and I just want to say how wonderful it is to partner with Montgomery County because without piggybacking on their contract, we would not exist. And it's been, uh, aging and disability has just been the most amazing partner for us and we're truly appreciative that they help us serve our clients so well. So thank you. I'm Tom Gill from Gaithersburg Meals on Wheels. And uh, I just want to echo the words of what has already been said. We've been serving the people of Gaithersburg since 1981. And as an example, last year we distributed over 33,000 meals with the uh, assistance of Asbury Methodist Village, our caterer. And uh, the program is a great program. One of the big benefits is it allows seniors who are disabled to stay in their own homes rather than have to enter an institution. So we at Gaithersburg are very appreciative of this uh, proclamation and uh, look forward to continue to serve the community. Uh, I'm Ed Rastatter. I'm with the uh, Bethesda Chevy Chase Meals on Wheels. Uh, we were started um, 50 years ago this month, and uh, we estimate that we've served uh, about a million uh, meals uh, since then. And 
have made it through the pandemic with uh, no hitches whatsoever due to our new president, uh, Dave Bennett. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I don't have anything to add to that other than that uh, we're all volunteer and uh, we, our volunteers do this because they know they're providing real assistance to people who really need it. And uh, so we appreciate the recognition, but I know that we're going to have people just doing it because they love the work. Uh, my name is John Frizzell, President Rockville Meals on Wheels. Uh, I don't have much to say other than to thank Councilmember Cash for his support. Uh, the City of Rockville, Montgomery County, Maryland, our incredible volunteers in the community. Thank you. I'm Charlie Madison. I'm Vice President of Rockville Meals on Wheels. I really have nothing more to add other than to say it's really a great honor to be able to do this uh, because it really enables the seniors to be stay in their own home a lot longer and to prevent them from having to join the institution. So thank you to the county for this recognition. We have one more of these, so you're going to share, and then we're going to add more to it. But, um, and I understand that Councilmember Stewart actually went to Coma Park, uh, Meals on Wheels. So we're we're working with you. Believe me, we're most appreciative. But because of all of that, I have a proclamation. Whereas on March 22nd, 1972, President Nixon signed into law a measure that amended the Older Americans Act of 1965 to include a national nutrition program for individuals 60 years and older. And whereas for more than five decades, this landmark law has helped to fund community-based organizations like Meals on Wheels, and it is still the only federal program designed specifically to meet the nutritional and social needs of older adults. And whereas this year's Meals on Wheels programs from across the co uh, county, or across the country, are joining together for the March for Meals awareness campaign to celebrate its success and garner the support needed to ensure these critical programs can continue to address food insecurity and malnutrition, combat social isolation, enable independence, and improve health for years to come, and whereas Volunteers for Meals on Wheels are the backbone of the program. They not only deliver nutritional meals to seniors and individuals with disabilities who are at significant risk of hunger and isolation, they also provide nutritional meals that help to maintain health and wellness for their clients. This essential service helps to prevent household accidents and hospitalizations and allow seniors to age in place and Whereas Meals on Wheels programs provide a needed social connection for seniors to help combat loneliness and isolation that can occur and the contributions and essential services this program has provided, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, where provisions of basic essential needs and safety net services were paramount to survival of our most valuable, uh, vulnerable residents and whereas Montgomery County's senior population continues to increase substantially. So ongoing support from Meals on Wheels programs and other local food nutrition and distribution programs will continue to be needed. Now therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland hereby proclaim March 2023 as the month celebrating Meals on Wheels. And it's signed today by me and Council President Evan Glass. Thank you very, very much for all that you do. We're going to put this here. I'm going to invite my colleagues to please join us. Somebody gets the whole the official
Okay, thank you for that proclamation. Thank you for everyone from Meals on Wheels spending Meals on Wheels spending their morning with us. Thank you. Um, now we're going to move to general business. Madam Clerk, do we have any announcements? Good morning, Council President, Council Vice President, Council Members. We have a few announcements today. The Council is seeking applicants to serve on the seven-member committee to recommend funding for the Public Election Fund. These positions are open to all residents of Montgomery County. Letters of interest must be received no later than 5 p.m. on Monday, April 10, 2023. The public hearing for Bill 1223, Police Traffic Stops Limitations, the STEP Act, has been rescheduled from June 13, 2023 to April 25, 2023 at 7 p.m. Speakers already signed up for this public hearing will be contacted with the new date. We've also added two items to our agenda today. One is item 16EE, the introduction of uh, FY24 transportation fees, charges, and fares. The public hearing for that item is scheduled for um, April 18th at 1.30 p.m. and the t &E work session is scheduled for April 20th, 2023. And lastly, we have added item 16.5. It's an action for the resolution to reaffirm an appointment under sec section 15-103 of the land use article of the Maryland Code. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. That's all you have. Thank you very much. Uh, the clerk has circulated the minutes for uh, March 1st, colleagues. Are there any changes? Not hearing any. Those are approved. Thank you. Uh, next, we are going to have a conversation with the nominee to serve as the chief services to end and prevent homelessness in the Department of Health and Human Services. Ms. Hung, I see you back there. If you want to join Mr. Madalino and Dr. Bridgers, there you are. Councilmember Glass, uh, President Glass, um, I failed in my remarks to the resolution to remind everyone to look at our new business center website so while as Ms. Hung is coming forward we have totally revamped our business assistance website made it much more user friendly um, so uh, for everyone who's watching please take a look at the the business center uh, website uh, and we're trying to watch you uh, we're waiting for the lights to go on and there you go it would be the first time the council kept the executive in the dark, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but boom, boom. Yes, 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 yes. I, I know, I know. That's why whenever I'm up here, I'm, I'm texting you. Can ask Miss Michelson. I'm texting her. This light bulb is out. That light bulb is out, isn't it? So, so that you're always in the in the being in the limelight. So, sunshine is the best policy. Yes. There we go. Okay. Well, Mr. Madalino. Thank you very much, Council President Glass and members of the County Council. It's my honor to be before you today to introduce our candidate for Chief um, for Services to End and Prevent Homelessness, Ms. Christine Hung. Um, Christine has been an experienced leader in the homelessness um, uh, services space for 17 years. She is a licensed clinical social worker. She has been serving people um, with, uh, fighting um, homelessness, including front-facing shelter work, case management, and program management. You know, sometimes we talk about trying to find a candidate, and we often lament about, you know, you can never find that unicorn. Uh, well, I think with Ms. Hung, we have found a unicorn, someone who has tremendous personal, professional experience in serving homelessness, a Montgomery County resident, a Montgomery County um, native, um, and someone who's, who's um, academic work and professional work has been in this space. She is currently the Director of Homeless Services at Interfaith Works, where she leads a team of about 120 people operating a drop-in center, four emergency centers in our county, and six supportive housing programs. As a nonprofit services provider, she has worked closely with the Division um, for, of Services to End and Prevent Homelessness. For years, she has been actively involved in numerous committees and work groups for the Interagency Commission on Homelessness. As I mentioned, she grew up in Montgomery County. She went to Wooten High School. She lives in Rockville with her husband and son, and we are thrilled that she's willing to take on this leadership role and this critical space for the county government. Wonderful introduction. Dr. Bridgers, do you have anything you want to add? 
Good morning, Council President Glass. Just wanted to add that I support the County Executive's um, nomination of Ms. Hung. Look forward to working with her in my uh, current role as the Acting Director of the Department of Health and Human Services. We have a lot of work to do uh, in this space, and Ms. Hung is a candidate to help me in my administration. You know, I pride myself on organizational development and um, pro a proactive approach and so I think that she brings that um, sense of um, responsiveness to our services to end and prevent homelessness and I welcome the discussion this afternoon thank Fan you fantastic uh, well Miss Hung it is uh, good good to see you this morning uh, I have had the pleasure of working with you over the last number of years uh, when I was the council's lead on homelessness and vulnerable communities I've seen your work uh, up close uh, and I know that you and your entire team uh, and everybody in the continuum of care um, has appreciated your leadership. And so uh, what we're going to do this morning, I have a series of questions I'll ask you and then we'll open it up to colleagues. Okay? Uh, do you have any opening comments you'd like to make? It, turn on your microphone if you want. Yes, just it's such an honor to be nominated for this position and also to be sitting here before such a diverse council. I, I'm just so thrilled to be here today. And I also wanted to introduce my family. Um, sitting behind me is my husband, as well as my parents and my brother. And my sister is watching online. She couldn't be here. She has a newborn, but um, they're here, as well as my col a few of my colleagues from Interfaith Works are here as well supporting me. Fantastic. Got a good network behind you. Uh, so the, the first question that I have for you, uh, if you could please describe your experience and background in education as they relate to the position of Chief Services to End and Prevent Homelessness. Absolutely. Thank you for your, count, um, thank you for your question, Council President. So I am the daughter of first-generation Korean-American immigrants. Both my parents um, experienced poverty at a young age as a result of their home country being occupied and oppressed by war. So the experience of poverty is close to my family. And they immigrated to the United States for a better life. And I want to say that today I stand on their shoulders because I would not be here today if not for the opportunities that they provided me. And I also wanted to talk a little bit about the reasons why I decided to pursue social work. So after I graduated from college, I was very interested in how we can change the racial disparities we see in our society, especially those at that time in the public education system. So that's what brought me to social work. And I decided to have multiple focuses, clinical work as well as um, case management, program management as well and community organizing. So I studied many things thinking that I would like to make a change at a higher level. After graduate school though, I um, came to work right away at what was called the community-based shelter here in Montgomery County. It was the first year-round shelter established. It was operated by my predecessor and my role model for many years, Priscilla Fox Morrill. And that's where I really began to understand the depth of need and the complexity that the homeless population of Montgomery County experiences. And I also um, came to learn the great depth of commitment that is needed in order to make a difference in the lives of these individuals that we serve. And today I carry that in the forefront of my mind all the time, both the depth of need of those we serve the awesome responsibility of seeking to help them and of course the commitment needed by those of us who are in this space to end their experience of homelessness. Um, I have such gratitude for my colleagues at Interfaith Works and all the staff who come to work every day because I know how demanding the work is and I wanted to share some of the accomplishments of um, our homeless services department under my leadership all done as a team. Teamwork is really a big part of the way in which we provide services. So in our emergency shelters since 2020, our staff in uh, the drop-in center and the four emergency shelters have housed 413 individuals since 2020. And in our permanent supportive housing programs of which we operate six, 
we have had a success rate of 98.8 percent of those we housed in supportive housing. These are some of the most vulnerable individuals in our county um, and they had maintained housing as well as we've supported them so that they would not have returns to homelessness. And in addition, in our newest program, Rapid Rehousing, um, which we started up during the pandemic in partnership with SEF and worked together on that program, we've had a 94% success rate of individuals we serve graduating that program so that they could live independently in the community. So I think um, my experience in leading this department as well as building a cohesive team, which is absolutely required for these types of successes, is what has prepared me to be the Chief of SEF. In addition, I, you know, I'm so excited at the prospect of coming to work for the government. I've worked with a number of the staff at SEF for my whole career. So um, Kim Ball, Tanya Jones, 17 years I've worked with them. In addition, um, I, I remember the very first Homeless Resource Day and the planning committee, which was led by Gloria Huggins, and how we put that together and came together as a broader team. So the, the staff at SEF, they, we worked alongside and handled really, really tough situations, including Alana Branda as well and Beth Driggers. Lasagna Kelly, I had so many light, late night calls with her whenever we had COVID positives in our shelter um, and we were effect, able to effectively keep our COVID um, rate below 2% for most of the pandemic because of that collaboration and hard work. Um, so I'm really excited at the idea of coming to work with Seth. Thank you very much for that. Uh, next question I have for you. What do you see as the top challenges facing the continuum of care ne service network for individuals experiencing homelessness in Montgomery County? And what do you see as the top opportunities for success? Thank you for your question. So I think the top challenge facing us as a county is the impending funding cliff for rental assistance. So when that rental assistance ends, it is very possible that we will see a dramatic increase in evictions, which would then lead to an increase in homelessness. So I, I also want to stop and acknowledge you, Council President Glass, and the entire council for the resolution seeking another $175 million for our state for rental assistance. I think that's going to be essential in trying to prevent those evictions. Um, in addition, I think it's really important for us to scale up our preventive work. And I would love to look into, with the council, with SEF, what kind of um, services we can expand, including services like eviction diversion. So that's um, a potential solution to the impending evictions that we're um, expecting. In addition, another challenge that we've been facing um, throughout the pandemic is the behavioral health crisis. So we have certainly seen the dramatic and um, increasing need for intense behavioral services in our shelters as well as our other programs. So that is the second challenge I foresee as well as the um, st staffing shortages we've experienced as well during the pandemic and since. And I think we have to work creatively to try to create a space where people want to come and work, where they feel valued, where they feel heard, and also not to minimize the impact of our work that it can be traumatizing, both directly and secondarily. And so to make sure we are providing adequate supports to those who come to work for us so that they want to stay and that they have longevity in um, their careers with us. Thank you. Can you please describe your understanding of the public-private partnerships that are central to the systems of support services provided through the services to end and prevent homelessness? Yes. Yes. So the public-private partnership is the backbone of our continuum. It is bringing together our um, government agencies like SEF and other agencies together with our nonprofit community, our housing providers and businesses. Um, and creating this collaboration that leverages our collective experience as well as um, 
the resources that each respective element has at their disposal and so that the combined effort is greater than the individual components and it's it's essential to the work we do it um, leads to innovation as well as um, just more resources than the for example Seth could alone bring there are far more resources when we work together and some of the accomplishments we've seen from the public-private partnership is we were able to end veteran homelessness together um, by the end of 2015. It's a huge accomplishment for our county. And we've also seen a dramatic decrease in homelessness in the last 10 years, a 50% reduction overall in um, people experiencing homelessness. This is according to the point in time count that we do each year. So it's, it's really been a very fruitful partnership and it, is, it underlies everything we do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. As Chief of Services to End and Prevent Homelessness, what would be your immediate priorities and what do you see as the longer term strategic priorities? Yes. So I think that the immediate priority would be to um, hit the ground with CEPH and assess what the needs are there um, to understand what CEF needs in order to be its most effective self and also to be a strong partner with the nonprofit community. That partnership, as I just described, is critical. And I think because I come from the nonprofit sector, I have a very good idea of what is needed there. And then going into CEF, working with my colleagues who I've known there for years, just understanding um, what is needed to make that partnership as effective as possible. And then lastly, um, there, there are concerns about safety in our shelters right now, and I see them every day. There are incidents that occur every single day, MCCH Interfaith Works, we see them on a regular basis. And so addressing the safety needs of the shelters would also be an immediate priority. So the longer term um, goals for me would be um, consistent with the strategic plan which I was actively involved in developing in 2019 so they are um, priorities such as building and supporting more affordable housing of course because we cannot end homelessness without more affordable housing in addition it would be reducing racial disparities across our system and also coordinating effectively across the system between the systems of care because the population we serve many of them have multiple health conditions uh, mental health conditions and so it makes for a great deal of vulnerability that needs um, more support from across systems behavioral health aging and disability so definitely the need to coordinate effectively and then of course continuing to educate and advocate for change across our community Thank you. Can you please discuss how you see Montgomery County's goal to end homelessness working with efforts in the federal and regional context, such as the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Council of Governments? Yes. So it's really important that we apply for every funding opportunity because, as I said, we must increase the amount of housing available to this population. So that would be every year when we have the notice of funding opportunity from HUD applying for every grant funding available there. Um, at Interfaith Works in 2021, I, on behalf of Interfaith Works, I wrote the grant application for the bonus project. It was a medical permanent supportive housing program and I, I was very, very pleased that we were awarded that grant and so today um, this program, which will be called Lon's House, it's literally a stone's throw away from this building on Fleet Street, um, that will be opening to serve some of the most vulnerable men in our system who would, who would need an intensive level of support. So there would be 24-hour support as well as case management. And that's exactly what we need to do. We need to continue applying for opportunities like that. And then as far as working regionally, we know that homelessness has no borders. In our hypothermia shelter, which we open seasonally at Progress Place, uh, Interfaith Works has observed that 50 to 65 percent of those who came in need of shelter um, during our coldest winter months were from other jurisdictions, primarily the district as well as PG County. So it is absolutely necessarily necessary that we work with our neighboring jurisdictions 
and we have those relationships through the Metropolitan Washington Council of Government. We just need to deepen them. We need to come up with practical steps that our front-facing staff can take in order to give a warm handoff to those jurisdictions. We certainly would continue to provide shelter to individuals as they present, but ultimately folks from other jurisdictions are not eligible for long-term housing in our county, and we can't do it alone. So it would be working across those jurisdictions to um, help house people. Thank you. Uh, if appointed, how would you position this role to work on racial equity and social justice issues? Yeah, such an important question, right? So whenever we look at our data on the demographics of people experiencing homelessness, it is deeply troubling to know that um, people of color are dramatically overrepresented amongst the population, especially black and African American households. Um, it is 55% of individuals experiencing homelessness that are black or African American, and it's 82% of all family households. That is very, very concerning. And in addition to that, more than half of individuals experiencing homelessness have some form of a disability, either a mental health disability, physical disability, or chronic health problem. And so it is so profoundly unjust to think that the intersectionality of being a person of color, of being vulnerable, means that you're more likely to experience homelessness. Um, and I know that everyone in this space believes that housing is a human right. So it isn't it is unacceptable that this is the outcome for so many people. Um, I, I wanted to say uh, um, that as, as much as racial equity is important, um, I also know that we are, are making steps forward. So it was Liz Kruger, a colleague of mine at Interfaith Works, as well as Kim Ball and Rosina Adhanam with Seth, as well as Terrence Hill, a founding member of the People's Committee who represented Montgomery County in the Regional Equity Action Committee. And together they developed an action plan for Montgomery County. I'm so proud of their work. I'm so proud that Interfaith Works was involved and Seth also and um, a person with lived expertise. And they came up with an action plan for us. And it would be my role as Chief of Seth to ensure that we follow through on the priorities that they came up with which include identifying racial disparities for those households seeking housing, as well as addressing those disparities in terms of access to housing and their outcomes, and then centering our system on lived expertise, that's peer support and peer advocacy, and then coming up with a system by which we could measure progress towards working on racial equity. Thank you. Last question I have right now is, are there any potential conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? So yes, there is a, a potential conflict of interest, which is that I am currently Director of Homeless Services at Interfaith Works, which receives significant funding from the county to operate the wonderful programs that we have. And there, there are, there's a code identifying, that's code 19A section 11, that um, I would not be able to ha um, do business or interact with uh, Interfaith Works because I, I had worked, I had been an employee there. Uh, I am an employee there and would, would have been an employee. So I have requested a waiver to this, to this code and um, we're awaiting the, the outcome of that request. In addition, I have um, decided that I would recuse myself if I were appointed chief from any contract administration with Interfaith Works for a full year. Um, and as well, you know, I, I would just pledge to be impartial to all the providers who come to work with Seth and to give equal consideration and to work together fairly with, with all the different um, partners that work with Seth. Uh, I appreciate that candor. I'll just weigh in and say I, I uh, appreciate the proactive steps that you're willing to take. Uh, not only w does the county executive expect um, impartial treatment of all of our non-profit uh, non service providers, but we do as well, as do our taxpayers. 
and the other nonprofits that you will work with will expect you to treat all of them equally mm -hmm. and fairly. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I'm now going to turn it over to the Chair of the Health and Human Services Committee, Councilmember Albernaz. Can I, uh, can uh, I jump sorry, in? Yes, I, Mr. Madalena. Thank you very much, Council President. Um, so the County Executive and I fully support the, the waiver request where we're waiting for the Ethics Commission to provide uh, additional guidance. Um, and um, I do think it's something that we, we need to think about moving forward of how we um, engage and recruit people who have enormous involvement within the community and, and how our rules and regulations should look towards um, providing us the opportunity to recruit people with enormous experience within the community and do so in a way that does not run afoul of the expectations our residents, taxpayers, you all have of a functioning executive branch. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Burgess. Council uh, President Glass, the director or his designee, his or her designee would sign contracts where there are conflicts of interest for the period um, as described in the ethics waiver on behalf of Ms. Hung. So there won't be any conflict of interest in that um, in that uh, space. Thank you. Thank you for the further clarification. Chair Albernas. So I'm just going to say something about this. Um, I, I used to work for the Latin American Youth Center and then I got the job as the director of the Recreation Department and of course the Latin American Youth Center and this was 16 years ago um, but it, it's important for us to be able to recruit from talented individuals here especially for something as critical as a function as the one that Ms. Hung is applying for now so that there is a smooth transition and we can hit the ground running because there is no learning curve. Um, and so I'll just say that publicly and uh, I, I appreciate very much, Ms. Hong, your willingness to step forward. You, our paths have crossed many times uh, over the last four years and I've always been very impressed by your leadership, your ability to bring communities together and your deep understanding of the complex issues, not just of the clients you all serve, but of the system that is before us. And so uh, th this, the, the job you're applying for is one of the most difficult in all of county government because there's a lot out of your control. And yet you are still held responsible for all of those coordinating bodies working together and policies that in some cases the county has no control over. So. Uh, it's it's rewarding but challenging work and I appreciate your willingness to step forward. Um, so just a couple of thoughts and a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned the importance and you're absolutely right of regional cooperation and collaboration. Could you expand on that a little bit because uh, there is no question that uh, we are not alone uh, in addressing these issues but uh, so there are times when some of our local jurisdictions will lean more heavily on Montgomery County to address some of those regional needs and we need that spirit of cooperation to be able to uplift and support our entire community. So how will you work with some of those local jurisdictions on these important issues? Yes, um, such an important question. I think that we have taken steps. I know there's a data sharing agreement in across jurisdictions so that we can look at who we're serving who is who is from our neighboring jurisdictions and vice versa i think what we need more of to look into are concrete steps that our workers can take so for example um, we have people presenting at our shelters who who are from dc and pg county on a regular basis and so our staff need to be able to have a contact in those jurisdictions where they can say we're, we're sheltering this individual looking into a housing plan and maybe we could divert them back to DC or PG with supports um, but we need someone to contact in those areas we do our best our staff do our their best to contact different um, providers in those jurisdictions but sometimes we don't get an answer sometimes we don't get a call back and so then oftentimes our workers are going it alone a bit and that's not effective at all um, and then we've seen examples of people where we can't reconnect them where they end up being in our county for you know an extended period of time and we don't want anyone to have an extended experience of homelessness we want them to immediately be diverted to either family or friends or to a long-term housing plan so those relationships need to be deeper um, and and that's something that 
I think it, it would take time, but also meetings with the right people in each neighboring jurisdiction. Thank you, I appreciate that. And, and for context, we have a pretty amazing infrastructure here in Montgomery County uh, between the community-based organizations, our incredible Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, we've been at the forefront in being a leader uh, in this space, and I really want to give credit to former Councilmember Leventhal, former chair of the HHS committee, former director of HHS Uma Uluwalia, um, Amanda Harris, and many of the staff that made what we have today possible. And so there's a lot to build off of. Um, I want to go back to something you said earlier just briefly. Um, people are exhausted. And we're still all, everybody went through some level of trauma during the pandemic, but particularly those frontline workers that never stopped working. And so how will you help support uh, and retain, and then of course by retaining, help recruit um, additional staff members, not just to the county, um, but to the nonprofit organizations that are doing this important work as well? Yeah, thank you for asking that question because it underlies all the potential of what we can accomplish. It's our staff who do all of that amazing yet very demanding hard work day after day. And that has been my privilege as Director of Homeless Service Services at Interfaith Works to lead a large team who on a daily basis and certainly during the pandemic have to navigate these demands and, and countless incidents, um, situations that they have to de-escalate. So for me, the key as a leader is to understand what they're dealing with, and that takes listening. It's listening to what they experience on a regular basis, listening to their supervisors also, hearing what we need to do so that they know they're supported and feel supported. So very recently, we experienced our staff a series of client deaths and violent incidents, and so what we did was we brought a trauma specialist in to meet with them. This was critical to retain the staff who had been the direct recipients of trauma um, to both acknowledge that what you just experienced was directly traumatic to you. And that was our way of say, acknowledging what they had to go through. And I'm really happy to say as a result of our intervention that none of the staff that experienced, um, it, was, it was a team, a, a small team of case managers and the program director who experienced trauma, and all of them are still working in my department as, as a strong and contributing part of the team. So those are the types of steps we need to take to support them, and we need to create generally a very supportive work environment so people know at all times we are a safe space to come to, to to let us know that you're struggling, that you're burning out, that you need more support. And, and that has been, as I said, my job over the last 17 years is to be in tune to that, to make sure our team has what they need to do the tough work every day. I appreciate that. My final comment uh, is Council President Glass did a great job um, as lead for this critically important issue these last four years. He took that responsibility very seriously, as did his entire team. Um, and so that helped continue and build a bridge from the great work that had been done previously. And although we don't have a point person now, I want to assure everyone in the public this remains among the highest um, um, and most important issues that we are going to be focusing on, not just in the HHS committee, um, but in the entire council. So uh, I want to thank you for your willingness to step forward. I look forward to supporting your nomination and more importantly, looking forward to working you, uh, with you to build on some of the, both the opportunities and challenges we have before us. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome to your family too. It's nice <laughs> to see them here. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair Albernaz, and you're right. I am no longer the lead, uh, but it is still a policy priority for, for you, me, and, and I think all of us here on the dais. So thank you. Councilmember Stewart. Great. Thank you so much. I, you've um, been asked a number of questions and have really laid out your knowledge and expertise, and it really is an honor to um, have you here today. Uh, I want to emphasize also in my time getting to know you, and I think your answer to the last question from Councilmember Albanaz and the fact that your colleagues and family are here is a demonstration not just of your depth of knowledge and understanding of these issues, um, but your deep empathy and compassion for people, the people you work with and the people you serve. So I'm, I'm so glad that you have stepped up for this position. Um, one qu uh, you've, asked, you've answered a number of questions, but one thing, uh, question that uh, came to my mind is, um, 
particularly looking at young people who may be experiencing um, challenges with housing and be unhoused and particularly looking at LGBTQ plus uh, community as we know around their country with the rise in anti-trans laws and other things that um, a state like Maryland and a place like Montgomery County that is welcoming we are likely uh, to see more people coming to us which is something that is is good for uh, you know that we can be that kind of place but that also means that we are likely to experiencing um, increases of people who are unhoused so just curious if, if you've had thoughts on that yeah definitely in in the homeless services space we have to be nimble and we have to be prepared for the need that presents itself and I, I think Montgomery County has made great ste steps thanks to SEF and the public-private partnership with the opening of the Youth Drop-In Center. I think it's so important that our workers are able to engage the people we seek to serve, which is why we, we, we need to have people who are experienced engaging youth. That's why we need to center our work on people with lived expertise. And in addition, um, we need to have system-wide training on engaging the LGBTQ population effectively. There are trainings available, but it isn't system-wide. And it's something that I think is very important because the social justice issue absolutely impacts all of these populations, and especially the LGBTQ population is overrepresented in people amongst people experiencing homelessness. And so we have to be skilled at engaging them, um, uh, affirming them, welcoming them into our programs, and it's, it is the same with youth as well. And also um, people who are coming, who are recent immigrants, refugees, we have to be prepared, whether it's language capacity, cultural competence, which I prefer to call cultural humility, um, and openness to what they bring, the difference, the differences in culture. Our, our staff need to be prepared and skilled to engage effectively. Thank you so much. I yield back my time. Thank you. Council Member Sales. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you so much for answering all of the questions um, today. Um, as a member of the Health and Human Services Committee, it's so important to ensure that, as you mentioned, housing is a human right. All of our residents have access to housing, uh, regardless of their income. And I've also participated in the point in time count. So thank you for keeping up with that effort so that we all know um, the capacity that we need to support and help people transition into homelessness. Um, you mentioned um, the collaboration and opportunities to um, make sure that residents have access to a variety of resources to make sure they can transition um, out of homelessness into the next phase and the importance of um, county agencies. Um, you may recall um, in last year in the fall, um, shortly after I was sworn into office, constituents were displaced due to the Gaithersburg explosion. Um, they reached out to our office assisting, um, requesting assistance to secure permanent housing. And one of the resources that were available to these families was an HOC voucher that could be made available to survivors of the explosion through a request from the county executive. The residents that contacted our office um, were not offered this voucher because HHS didn't know they existed. Um, it was only after the information was publicized by WTOP did um, SEF start to pursue um, these resources. So can you share how you plan to prevent something like this happening in the future so that any residents who are experiencing such a devastating and traumatic experience um, can access the resources, the incredible amount of resources that we have in the county? Yes, thank you for that question, Council Member Sales. 
when a family is experiencing some, uh, such a devastating loss as their home, we do have to be prepared to intervene and provide um, housing supports, some of which may be temporary because as we all know, housing is not readily available the moment someone experiences homelessness. And that's why we need also temporary solutions. I know that our county has relied on hotels, um, but to your question about housing being more readily available, I, I do think we need to deepen our relationship between SAF as well as our housing authority, HOC. I think that there are times when we're, we as I said before, we need to more closely collaborate, closely coordinate, uh, because as you pointed out, the resource was there. It's just Seth didn't know. And um, in some ways, you know, I can't fault Seth. I think they, the same as the workers at Interfaith Works, are, are constantly facing the crises of the people experiencing homelessness. However, I think that relationship should be strengthened because in, in, in all frankness, I think that we can end homelessness if we have access to those resources. And I, I think having more communication and discussion on the availability of those resources is, is really critical. Um, having said that, I am not there with Seth yet, so I can commit to working with you, working with the council mm -hmm. to look into it and to see what more can be done. Thank you so much. Um, just one other question, um, and thank you for that because, um, you know, we recently interviewed with the new director of Department of Permitting Services, and we have a variety of toolbox grant programs for mm -hmm. applying resources for businesses that want to move here, and they immediately were able to update their website to have all those resources and programs added. So I'm looking forward to working with you of you are confirmed. Um, my last question is, um, you mentioned the um, incredible disparities that um, are facing uh, black and brown communities that are disproportionately facing homelessness. Um, and are there any targeted interventions that um, come to mind? Um, I know that you did some work with the Housing Justice Act. I just want to make sure that we have some benchmarks, as you mentioned, I believe, in the People's Strategic Plan. So I don't know if you wanted to speak any more about that. Yes. So just with regard to housing discrimination, which is what led to the Housing Justice Act, that is something we're still seeing. We continue to see our, our workers on the ground households that are issued um, non-renewals of their lease and will then have to you know be displaced our, our workers are very diligent in looking for new housing for them but that is definitely problematic and and so at the state level i think it's really important um, it's my hope that the legislation for just cause evictions will be passed um, that would really help so that you know, a reason is given at least when a family is asked to leave to that their lease would not be renewed. So I, I think that that's something we need to advocate for. I know our county executive testified on behalf of that legislation, so I'm hopeful that it will pass. And then in addition, I, I think that we need to um, fine tune our assessment tools for individuals and households experiencing homelessness who are coming to us. So we have uh, a set of standard assessment tools, one of which um, there's been identified a bias uh, against African American black women. And I think those of us in shelters and interfaith works operates the two year round women's shelters. We can see that there's often a hesitation, um, maybe a lack of trust because it takes time to build trust to share the full level of need of an individual. So it is very important that we find an assessment tool that does not have that bias and is better able to assess the need. So those individuals, black and brown, are able to access our housing resources more readily. So those are some concrete steps I think we can take. Thank you, I look forward to learning more.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Council Member Sales, if I may. Um, yes. You know, we, we, we face an, an unusual and unique opportunity when you think about broadly housing um, policy in the county with, um, for a variety of reasons, a new HHS director, a new CEF director, a new permitting services director, a new DHCA director, a new planning board chair, a new planning director, a new executive director of HOC. Um, I know on our part for the executive branch agencies, the county executive has made it very clear in interviews for these positions that he expects a degree of collaboration and coordination that we have not seen for a variety of reasons um, over the last several years. And that's why we're very excited about Ms. Hong's experience and um, desire to be part of that collaboration. Um, and I know Dr. Bridgers is also working very hard on that um, so that we can all be on the same page because we recognize that these issues cut across a variety of departments, a variety of rationale. And if we wanna make um, progress, we need to have everyone at the table, including you, the, the council, in order to address these issues so that we can make progress in the county on serving unhoused individuals and creating opportunities for other people to seek to, to have um, affordable and accessible housing. Thank you, Rich. I, I totally agree with you and I'm glad that we have all of these new leaders in place to better coordinate across the departments. Um, I visited Interfaith Works last night to um, serve dinner with some of the residents, so there is a definite need for coordination and collaboration. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, thank you very much, Councilmember Sales, for those questions, and Ms. Hung for uh, mentioning the, the Housing Justice Act, which Councilmember Katz and I uh, passed a number of years ago. And if it is not being applied, uh, or enforced in a way that protects our residents and particularly residents who had experienced homelessness and are no longer able to find permanent housing because of their previous situation, then we will all work to improve that. So thank you. Uh, Council Member Jawando. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Ms. Hong. Good to see you uh, and your family um, and your team uh, in the back there. And I think it speaks volumes about you and your team in particular, you know, they're seated in the back because they are just of service. They don't, they just, I've seen how they work and I've seen how you work with them. I was, I've never been more excited to see a, a nomination come before my desk than when I saw your name. And we've had a lot of good people. Sorry, Rich. <laughs> um, and Dr. Bridges, two people I, I think are doing a, a great job in their roles. Um, but I, I, I'm not being hyperbolic. I have seen you work over the last many years, um, and you could be doing anything, uh, but you've chose to dedicate your life to those, to serving those who need help uh, and help get them to a better place. And I just want to say thank you for that. Um, you've said today a lot, and so I won't uh, go over that, but I, I, I want to give you an opportunity now and in the future because I've had conversations with you about this in the past, to be bold in what you ask for um, to solve the problem of ending homelessness. You know, it is, as you spoke to very eloquently, um, it is unjust, improper, unfair, and, and not doesn't have to happen that we have the extent of the people experiencing homelessness, families experiencing homelessness, and the disparities we have in those experiencing homelessness in Montgomery County. Uh, which is one of the wealthiest counties uh, in our nation. Um, and we need you in this role and to ask us for what you need, resource-wise, but also policies. You've advocated for several today, the uh, expansion of rental assistance, which we are all on board with. Uh, you mentioned uh, the need for just cause eviction at the state level. Uh, we're we're going to have two public hearings tonight on a rent stabilization, anti-rent gouging bills, um, which I know I'll let you speak to it, but I believe is an important part of the pie for the work that you're doing. Meaningful stability for people who, while they're in their housing, which is connected to Just Cause and what we're seeing there. Um, so I wanted to allow you to expand on uh, any other issues, in particular the, the role of case managers. And you mentioned the trauma and, but as far as do, what do you have, do we have what we need 
in those roles as far as level of support, number of people, um, and if not, what do you think is the vision for that? And any other policies you think you'd like to talk to? No, I, th I thank you for your points and for focusing in our on our case management team. They are the engine that moves people from an experience of homelessness to housing. They're the ones making the individualized housing plans and doing all the hard work, all the heavy lifting to make the move to housing possible. They're moving people into their homes. They're making sure they have everything they need on the day that they move in, you know, to make it a home. And what I think is necessary there to strengthen those ranks is that I think we need to look at our hiring practices. I think that there are so many people who are qualified to do case management, but because of the requirements um, in many of the contracts are quite stringent that some folks don't qualify to become case managers. Oftentimes our front-facing shelter staff are interested in those positions and they've shown that they have a great deal of experience because they've worked in our shelters for years and can be case managers. So I think we have to revisit that so that we're not setting artificial barriers to that team of case managers. And it's, it's Interfaith Works, the Montgomery County Coalition for the Homeless. It's all of the provider community that rely on their case management team to ensure that there is success in ending the experience of homelessness for each person they work with takes tremendous skill and heart and commitment and and I can say that we see people who are ready but yet they don't meet the criteria to qualify so that's the first step that I would like to see have happen and then also um, different supports like the one I mentioned, a trauma specialist, I think that that should be standard uh, for for CEF, for our nonprofit community. Not just bringing in a contractor, but having it Exactly, there. exactly, because the work is, is traumatic, if not directly, secondarily, commun um, cumulatively, just hearing the trauma narratives of a population that has such a depth of trauma in their history. Um, over time is traumatizing for our, our, t our staff and it's our case managers who usually hear those stories and over time leads to burnout and leads to um, abrupt ending of careers and, and we shouldn't see that happening for our most committed um, workers. I appreciate that um, and last thing I'll say I agree with you uh, we, sh we should do that there's a number of areas Councilmember Albert has mentioned this your conflict is not a conflict, it makes you qualified for the job. Similarly, uh, in qualifications, as you described, so many of the people who would be the best case managers, or sometimes the case in our schools, the best paraeducators, you know, there's a lot of areas where we, I think we create artificial barriers for folks. So I'm, I'd like to look at that in your, in your area, but also in other areas, I think in county government, with social workers, there's, there's a lot of areas where um, I think we can benefit from people who are dedicated, committed, have demonstrated uh, that they're good at the job. Um, and last thing I'll say is I really appreciate your direct answer around racial equity. You gave a couple of illustrative examples of fine-tuning the assessment tools uh, for bias. This is something that you know I've raised with Ms. Harris and others and uh, it is a stubborn and multifaceted interconnected problem of why you see the deep disparities and who is experiencing homelessness. And I, I do think that um, I would ask that once you're approved, because we're all going to vote for you, I'm pretty sure of that, of that, that you would also uh, work with MoCo Boost. As you know, uh, uh, this entire, the previous council and with Councilmember Albernaz, it's our guaranteed income program where a hundred of the recipients are folks who are in the continuum of care of homelessness. And I've met with some of them recently. Um, I think there's some, some info to glean there about their experiences, which reflect the, dis the disparities in the homeless population uh, and some connectivity as we're trying to figure out and deal with this really stubborn problem of the deep disparities in who's experiencing homelessness. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you. Council Member Mink. Thank you, Council President, uh, and thank you, Ms. Hung, for um, all of your very thoughtful answers today and for all of your work over the years. Uh, we're, we are 
clearly very excited to have such a qualified, thoughtful, dedicated um, candidate before us. So really look forward to the work. Um, and I, I also wanted to emphasize before I get to my question, um, to reemphasize the question uh, raised by Councilmember Stewart around uh, the influx of LGBTQ+, and especially trans uh, young people who are already beginning to make their way here. I'm so glad to be in a community where that is known as a, as a place to be, uh, where we can provide that kind of safety and soon um, uh, health services because of our state level legislation. Um, but it's definitely going to be something that we're going to really need to lean into. I think you raised a great point about system-wide trainings and the necessity of that. Um, and thinking about um, uh, dedicated housing also is something that I think that we're really going to need to think about, especially with the closing of Casa Ruby uh, and just very, very limited options here um, where those young people can truly feel safe and secure. Um, so appreciate your thoughtfulness around that also. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts about our current crisis center process. Um, I uh, recently had a, an experience myself, um, as <laughs> Stock Tributors knows and, and helped with, um, following a, the Lakelands Council Forum that we had not too, too long ago. Um, in talking to folks afterwards, I came upon a family that had just been evicted. Um, the day prior and they were looking for housing. Uh, they were there with a five-year-old. Uh, they had actually had emergency housing the night prior, um, which was the first night they had been evicted, and then they had been told that for the second night that they no longer had housing anymore. Um, and so as I sat with them and we were making calls, you know, we called the crisis center and, and, um, and uh, it, it took hours we were there till into the night with this five-year-old and it eventually took you know, a call to Dr. Bridgers to step in and, and make sure that, that things got done. Um, but uh, my concern is that in speaking with advocates um, you know, over the years that night and then following, it does not seem like unfortunately that was an anomaly. And I, and I was dropping like I'm a council member from starting with my second call when I was like this, I've got a five-year-old here that we need to get, and it's st still ours. And so my concern, of course, is for all of the folks who cannot call and say I'm a council member, how long is it taking them and what is their success right there? Um, we get a lot of metrics around, um, you know, how many people we successfully house, which is great, around, you know, how much money we are putting towards these efforts, which is so important. Um, but I wonder about how, what are, how many people are we losing? How many people leave because they weren't able to get that shelter? How many people called in um, and then say, we'll call you back, and they don't get a call back? Uh, and I, I just am not confident that we have meaningful metrics there. Um, so I wonder if you could just speak to, it, again, our, the current process that we have at the Crisis Center, where you see room for improvement uh, in the process itself, as well as data collection, uh, and any thoughts that you might have related to that. Yeah. So th this is an area, certainly, that is impacted by staff shortages. The Crisis Center, we partner with very closely for referrals to our shelters, and so just from from a provider perspective for the individuals we advocate for from the clients um, I can say that yeah that there are times that um, there there isn't a readily available solution that the crisis center can offer and and we've noted um, significant delays in response times in the mobile crisis team as well but I do believe all of this is very much about the staffing shortage. Having said that, that's not an excuse. I think that when a person and, and or family present in need of housing and shelter, we have to have more options available. I, I don't think just shelter is adequate for everyone. Um, different families, individuals who are very vulnerable, there may be circumstances that make shelter, congregate shelter, not the best option and therefore I think that we need to work together to explore what other options there are. I'm not sh um, sure if, if that's hotel. I know that the county has relied on hotel in the past and um, that seems like a logical re option but I'm not sure why that wasn't available for more than just a day because certainly it would take longer than a day to find long-term housing. One of the things that we're doing that is very effective is our um, diversion efforts. So diversion, we've been trying to, Seth 
um, has been trying to work with the crisis center. They have diversion specialists who are based there during certain hours. So when I talk about the staffing shortage, that's critical because we need to close the gaps in the staffing of diversion services. The reason is because when a family presents for need, if they can present in need of shelter or housing, if they can meet with a diversion specialist immediately, 24-7, then there's a good likelihood that diversion specialist can connect them to someone in their natural support system so that they can stay with them until more longer term housing becomes available. That works for a, a large percentage of families, actually larger than on the single side. That's an op option we always have to explore, but right now it's, it's a limited number of hours, it's typically Monday through Friday, I think between 10 and 6, something along that. But certainly I would look into it together with the CEF team. So there needs to be an expansion of diversion services. So when a family presents, they're not just, you know, total, okay, this is what we have and just for a day. It's not going to work because as soon as that day is over, they're going to be in the same crisis they were, which I can't underscore enough how traumatic it is for, some, for a family to suddenly lose everything that was familiar to them. Um, so we have to be ready with more options than what we have now. And it would be my commitment, that was why um, safety and shelter is also important. Um, it's, it's also connected because when, when an individual is involved in a violent incident at a shelter, we can't just keep them there because all the people who saw that violent incident, our staff who are often the victims of assault in these incidents, it would be traumatic and re-traumatizing to keep that person there. So we need additional options. We do not want anyone to be on the street. So we have to be flexible and have more um, different options available. So th those are my thoughts on the situation. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, Dr. Bridgers. Councilmember Ming, thank you for that question. And uh, I, I look forward to working with um, Ms. Hung and Dr. Santiago. We've had conversations about our uh, crisis center and Dr. Uh, Stoddard, who's uh, joined us today as well, talked about our uh, mobile crisis outreach team. So in these two spaces in these service areas we really need to take a deeper dive as we've talked before mr madalino um, uh, emphasized the new leadership and how we are working across uh, the department of health and human services to look at more integrative services and spaces where we know that there's um, a need staffing and resources um, have been a challenge coming um, moving from a pandemic state to an endemic state but we really need to, to, to take a step back and look at those compliance um, those those risk um, areas where we know that looking at the data to, to, to determine better outcomes and so uh, Ms. Hung and I did have some preliminary conversations about this space and we really need to work with these two service areas to make sure that we have a holistic approach in response to the community Thank you. I appreciate that, and, and I appreciate all the all the thoughtful remarks from you as well, Ms. Hung. Um, and I just, as we move forward in this work, I think to your point that there is a lot of opportunity here with all with all of the newness before us. Uh, and I want to really encourage all of us to lean into and to seek out um, not just the things that are working, but the things that are not working. To be looking for that the bad news as well, because that is also how we're going to identify uh, those problems. You know, reaching out to hear from advocates on the ground who are working with uh, our, our folks seeking shelter in those moments who are used to being their advocates side by side and, and going into battle with the crisis center unfortunately some of sometimes the mentality that, that I hear and and we I think really uplifting those voices and embracing those stories because that's how we're going to to find like where what can we fix on the negative side of this spectrum to make it look more like what happens when we have the positive outcomes that's how we're gonna find those things is making sure that we don't shy away from those stories so thank you so much appreciate it I yield. Uh, thank you councilmember Ludke thank you mr. president um, first off I just I, I need to sing your praises for all of your collaborative work um, you know your your interdisciplinary approach to your work um, and, and that is at the heart uh, and you know the level of deep 
experience that you have as to why you'd be the perfect candidate for this role and I really do truly appreciate your candor in discussing you know the potential conflict and you know certainly acknowledging that there are um, guardrails or parameters that can be put up to, to you know shield you from 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 that but your transparency on that issue is is greatly appreciated and um, you know I view this no different than medical providers in a particular area who have a non-compete agreement in their in their clause with their medical practice well we still need their services right so um, this is to me akin to that type of a situation um, council member Abernaz brought up a great point that a lot of what you need to do or what affects the work that you will do and have been doing is actually out of your control right there's only so much that can be done at the county level um, but uh, and, I, and I feel quite confident you will receive this position uh, today but in that new role as chief of staff what do you propose to do knowing that there are those limitations on what we can actually accomplish here at the county to um, advocate for and make changes that are very necessary at the state and federal level particularly with respect to missing options for the population of individuals who you know for whom staying in a, a congregant housing uh, situation isn't working or they require high, higher level supports um, so if you could speak to that and what you would view your new role since you would have a new position to advocate in, at that level what would you do Thank you for that question. So I think it is vitally important for the public-private partnership to do um, the education and advocacy on what we can and can't do on our own. So at the state level, there, there are many things, many limitations there currently on especially behavioral health services. So certainly as the chief of staff, I would be um, be able to share information about how those limitations such as um, the availability of residential rehab programs to the many people experiencing homelessness who have severe mental illness that they're just not able to get placements and I was really really pleased to see um, the bill on the expansion of certified community behavioral health clinics that would be a great help to the people we serve um, and there's much more that needs to be done so uh, I, I would be very much there to communicate the needs um, to our state legislators and I think that as a continuum of care as a public-private partnership all of us can be communicating the needs because we see it on a daily basis and as much as we need to build and support affordable housing we also need to support our most vulnerable residents who have severe behavioral health conditions we can't um, we can't just say how I mean we are absolutely housing first but it's not just housing it's also the supports that are needed so I think that would be my response to yeah that that I would be an ambassador in a sense for the needs of our system Thank you, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member Friedson. Well, good morning. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Um, compassion uh, is uh, a word that comes from the Latin word uh, to suffer together. And uh, in the work that you have been doing, that's something that you have always embodied and I've always admired you for that. And this work, incredibly challenging work, uh, unique work, each story, each lived experience is different and has to be treated as such. We have to create systems that can address case by case basis challenges and that is very, very difficult to do. And it requires patience and it requires empathy and it requires persistence and uh, I think we have seen you doing that work for quite a long time. And so I share with colleagues there's lots of conversations to have about the shelters and how we move forward with some of the challenges that we have with the shelters and with nonprofit partners and how we work together with nonprofit partners coming out of this unprecedented crisis that we have faced that has created new and expanded uh, you know existing uh, crises 
uh, rent relief and how we address those issues, which I don't think we have appropriately or adequately solved up to this point and need a lot of work to figure out uh, and work together on. Uh, but um, I, I don't think there's anything that I could ask you here that would demonstrate your fitness for this job than what we've seen you do and the work that you have been doing. And so I normally am a person who asks very tough questions here <laughs> and uh, I think uh, your colleagues who are uh, sitting next to you can attest to that uh, at, at times. Uh, uh, but uh, I just uh, wanted to uh, say that it's amazing what you can accomplish when you don't care who gets the credit. And you have been a public servant for a long time, despite the fact that you are applying for this job and nominated for this uh, role for the first time in a truly public county role. The work that you have been doing has certainly been public service. So uh, look forward to working with you in this role. I share the, uh, the, the words and the comments of colleagues. You can hear in the questions from colleagues that there are some real serious challenges facing our most vulnerable residents that we absolutely need to address. Uh, but I, I feel confident that you have the mentality and the humility and the background experience to be able to work together with all of us to address them. So uh, looking forward to that. Uh, congratulations. Hello to your family and to your colleagues. Uh, and um, uh, as a longtime admirer of your work, I'm really appreciative that the executive is uh, moving forward your nomination. I look forward to supporting you. Thank you. Council, Council Member President. Council Member Albernas. Thank you. Just very briefly, I failed to mention in my comments, um, recognizing the Interagency Commission on Homelessness. Um, their work is fantastic. It's important. And I also want to acknowledge Beth Schumann, my Chief of Staff, is the Council's representative to the ICH. Um, and so we look forward to the continued collaboration. And I do want to give a plug to the People's Committee. Uh, which are an extraordinary group of leaders with lived experiences that provide invaluable information, not just to the commission, but to the body as a whole. I know you're committed to that work. There was some concern whether or not that would continue, uh, and I'm sure it will, um, but I really want to thank you so much again, Ms. Hall. With that, I yield back to you, Mr. President. Uh, and thank you, Councilman Brabanaz, for uh, taking the baton when we passed it over for the ICH. It's important work, and uh, I know that you'll continue uh, doing a good job and helping lead that organization. Uh, last word from us is from Councilmember Balcom. And it will be brief. Um, thank you for being here today. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I, I want to thank you for your work and for your service to the community and for your very thoughtful, thorough answers today. Uh, and I also want to thank the team. Um, thank you for being here and thank you for all that you do in, in our community. Uh, the, the Interfaith Works, Works is a very highly respected organization in our community. I think it touches just about everybody in, in the county, so I appreciate that. I uh, also want to thank Council President Glass for his work on this very important issue through the years. Uh, I just want to echo something that Councilmember Jawando mentioned, uh, and I think it's very important to, uh, as you assume this role, please be bold in your requests and your advocacy. You've been uh, a very strong advocate uh, for the community that you serve, and I would expect that in your new role that you would be just as bold uh, in, in your advocacy. So uh, I just want to put that out there. Um, thank you. And thanks. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Hong, you've heard from all of us, and uh, you and your family and your colleagues can leave the chamber um, assured um, of, of our support for you. Um, the work that you have uh, been doing over the last number of years with Interfaith Works and within the, the Interagency Commission on Homelessness and within the continuum of care is exactly what we need to be bold, to move forward, to ensure that everybody who needs shelter and a home has it. Um, and our social service agencies um, are the backbone of this work. And so having somebody who knows how they operate and how they can do better is exactly what we need at this moment. So um, look forward to working with you um, and uh, we will uh, be in touch very, very soon. Thank so you, thank Council you. Council President, thank you, Council Members. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all for everything that you do, especially your colleagues in the back. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, colleagues, uh, we are now entering legislative day number 10 with the introduction of bills. Uh, the only bill that we are going to be introducing today is Bill 1823, Structure of County Government, Community Zoning, and Land Use Resource Office. A public hearing is scheduled for April 18th at 1.30 in the afternoon, and a Planning, Housing, Parks Committee work session will be scheduled at a later date. I'll turn it over to the bill sponsor, Councilmember Friedson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as uh, Colleagues uh, know the county executive has proposed reinstating the Office of People's Council in his proposed fiscal year 24 operating budget, uh, which uh, comes at a cost of $246,375. There are a variety of opinions as to whether or not this office was a good and appropriate use of public tax dollars in the past. The Office of Legislative Oversight issued a report on the Office of People's Council in 2008. Uh, I am not aware that the county executives provided any information or suggested amendments to the office that would address some of the findings, which included significant racial equity concerns for how the office was previously implemented. Last year, the council took this up, decided and opted not to fund the office in light of those concerns and uh, because of the fact that those issues had not been uh, addressed. Today, I'm introducing Bill 1823, which would amend the law pertaining to the Office of People's Council to create an alternative, a community zoning and land use resource officer. The bill provides an alternative approach to an office that has been funded by the County Council, that has, excuse me, not been funded by the County Council since 2010 due to those uh, significant concerns about equity and uh, what was considered an ill defined notion of what defines, quote, protecting the public interest. In the past, the People's Council had full discretion as to what cases, hearings, plans, and appeals that, the, that they would be engaged in. This new concept would remove the advocacy piece uh, and the discretion that accompanied it and focus on the objective delivery of information and education about the land use process to our residents. The creation of a community zoning and land use resource officer could be created with significantly fewer dollars than the county executive proposes because it would not require a, uh, an attorney to fill the uh, position. So it would come at a, at a lower cost uh, in terms of the personnel. The position as envisioned would not serve as a legal advocate, but rather an objective impartial resource for information and education related to the land use process, avoiding some of the parity concerns that have been raised in the past by the Office of Legislative Oversight and that were discussed significantly during the Planning uh, and uh, Housing and Economic Development Committee review last year. As the PHP Committee and the Council debate the merits of the Office of People's Council as proposed by the County Executive, this bill will provide us an alternative for consideration and discussion. I hope that we can have that discussion and uh, determine what is the best path forward to ensure that our residents have access to the information about a process that is very cumbersome and very confusing to experts, uh, much less to residents and advocates and community members. Uh, and so uh, the intention of uh, this uh, bill is to move it forward for consideration and uh, should the will of the body uh, be to move uh, in a different direction, uh, this would avoid the uh, choice that we were provided last year essentially, which is to move forward with the Office of the People's Council uh, with all of the concerns and uh, not being addressed. Uh, or, or to not move forward at all and not and not fund it. So appreciate your uh, consideration. We'll be happy to uh, discuss as we move forward the budget process and uh, happy to turn over to Ms. Uh, Nadu if she has anything to add uh, to what I've shared here today. Nothing to add today. Thank you. There you go. Good enough job describing it. Uh, Councilmember Ludke. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, uh, Vice President Friedson uh, for bringing this bill. I'd love to co-sponsor this. I, I uh, really truly appreciate what you've done here and I share your concerns with respect to the Office of People's Council and appreciate the parameters that you've outlined herein. Thank you. Thank you and that legislation is introduced. Thank you very much. Uh, next we're going to go to call of bills for final reading. Uh, there are four bills before us today. The first one is Bill 123, the first bill introduced 
earlier this mm -hmm. year. Uh, property <laughs> tax credit, elderly individuals and retired military services members amendments. The GEO committee recommends enactment with amendments. I'll turn it over to the GEO chair, uh, Council, Member, uh, Council Member Stewart. Great, thank you. Um, so this bill 1-23 was sponsored by Council Member Sidney Katz, who I'll turn it over to in a moment, and I think uh, co-sponsors for most of the Council. Um, what this bill would do would update the eligibility uh, for certain elderly, and I put elderly in quotes because I'll take that up in a moment, individuals and retired military service members to receive a property tax credit increasing the assessment threshold by $50,000. The bill seeks to update the assessed value to 70 seven hundred thousand for senior residents and five hundred and fifty thousand for retired members of the military to account for increases in property values during the last few years the credit must be granted each year for seven years if the in individual remains eligible for the credit the government operations and fiscal policy committee unanimously recommends enactment of this bill with an amendment uh, which i'll discuss in a moment uh, the committee did discuss uh, an amendment and we thank Council Member Jawando for sending it over to us and for the letter that is included in the packet today. Council Member Jawando requested amending section 52-110C1B from 40 years to 20 years to, uh, for eligibility. Uh, the Government Operations Committee had an in-depth conversation regarding this amendment and at this time we did uh, vote no to recommend the amendment for two reasons. Uh, one, we discussed the racial equity and social justice impact statement which uh, ra did raise some concerns. The Office of Legislative Oversight did, does anticipate that the bill will have a minimal negative impact on racial equity and social justice in the county. Data by race and ethnicity on home ownership rates and older adult and veteran constituents suggest that white homeowners would disproportionately benefit from the changes proposed by this bill. Further, a financial benefit that disproportionately benefits white constituents would exasperate existing racial disparities in cost burden among homeowners, as white homeowners already experience the lowest level of cost burden by race and ethnicity. OLO anticipates the negative uh, racial equity and social justice impact of this bill as considered would be minimal since it is expected the extent of eligibility for the property tax credit to reach a small number of constituents. Um, under how it is currently drafted by Council Member Katz was that the property tax credit would go to 15 to 20 older adult constituents and one to two military retirees. So for that reason, um, the committee um, recommended moving forward with the bill, but at this time um, did not recommend changing the years of eligibility from 40 to 20. Um, in addition, um, I believe it's Council Member Friesen has requested an OLL report to look more in depth at tax credit programs and what would be most beneficial to residents, whether it would be, um, as suggested, lowering the number of years um, to 20 or 30, the committee also discussed whether or not um, we should extend the availability of years from seven to longer than that. And given that that report is um, underway, uh, we felt it was a, a good idea at this time to hold on any further amendments. Um, we do want to remind residents as we enter budget season and other things that um, what we are discussing today only covers one of several tax relief programs provided by the county. Other programs include um, those for senior residents of limited income, the residential real property tax deferral for seniors of limited income, and the property tax refund for disabled veterans and blind persons. And there's also a more generally applicable tax relief program which provides a homeowner's tax credit. Um, again, the committee wanted to thank Council Member Jawando and urges the entire council to read um, uh, the letter included in the packet for our consideration in the future. The other amendment that we did discuss was changing the title elderly um, in, in the bill and um, to staff suggests has two suggestions um, and instead of saying elderly change it to say individual 65 and above or seniors. So the two thing two uh, suggestions in front of us is to call the bill the bill 1-23 property tax credit individual 65 and above and retired military service members 
or Bill 1-23 property tax credit seniors and retired military service members. So I think that's something council needs to decide and I will turn to council member Katz for any additional comments. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Madam Chair, turn it over to the spot bill sponsor, Mr. Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, first off, everything has been said. Uh, the, I do believe that if we call it the, the reason I thought that we should change the title from elderly is we all know each and every day Councilmember Friedson is getting closer to that elderly <laughs> title, and, and I didn't want him to, to be, you know, uh, singled out. Um, I think if you, if you, don't say anything, Friedson. Don't start. I'll hold it back. Don't try, start. Try. Um, if we call it senior, the, my concern is that senior has a different meaning everywhere. Sometimes as a senior citizen, as someone 50 years old, sometimes it's 55, sometimes it's whatever, and I believe we should be as clear on this as we can be. That's why I would be supportive of individuals 65 and above, and everything else has certainly been mentioned on this. I'd like to thank all of my colleagues, and I think that there has been an updated uh, packet that indicates that all of the co uh, of our colleagues have been uh, co-sponsors of this legislation as well. And with that, unless there's questions, I will turn it back to you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you very much, Councilmember Jawando. Thank you, and I appreciate uh, the, both the sponsor and the GO chair and the GO committee for their consideration of my amendment. And uh, you know, I said this when you introduced the bill, the first bill that. I, you know, I wanted to co-sponsor it because I do think we all know that our seniors have, are having challenges aging in place. Um, going along with our previous conversation, we also know there's disproportionality um, in how that's experienced. Um, and I had stated at that time that I would seek to change the eligibility. Actually, we heard testimony in the public hearing around reducing the number from 40 years, which is a very long time. Uh, to be able to be eligible for this seven-year credit. Um, the racial equity impact statement was mentioned uh, by uh, Councilmember Stewart um, in that this bill, as drafted, is would have a detrimental impact um, on uh, racial equity in that it helps a very small, homogeneous set of homeowners. Um, and it will, it will cost some money, uh, but because that group is so small, it won't be as big. Um, I will not offer my amendment uh, today, uh, but I do, as I said in the memo that uh, I appreciate being included in the packet, um, we need to have a comprehensive look about an equitable way to alloc to, to on property taxes and credits um, and to provide relief in a way uh, that helps everyone, uh, which is the goal of this bill, to help our seniors. But for example, if, you know, African Americans, uh, this council has passed a resolution declaring racial ec um, racism a public health crisis. One of the ways is that African Americans die much younger. Uh, they acquire home ownership at much later, uh, which just is one of the many reasons uh, for the racial equity statement. So, um, I, you know, I, I will su support the bill today. It was a tough call for me because, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to see us extend this to more people, but I'm, I'm doing so in the hopes that we can come back to this very soon uh, and look at how we uh, provide this needed credit uh, for, that's needed for all of our seniors across populations. So appreciate Councilmember Katz and appreciate the consideration of the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Friedson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the conversation. Um, I agree that we do need to have a comprehensive look uh, into uh, this issue more broadly than the bill modestly address, which I think is uh, is is helpful and a, a positive step forward. I really appreciate Councilmember Katz for moving it forward. In fact, I had requested an Office of Legislative Oversight report specifically to do that even before this bill was introduced, as I noted uh, at introduction. So I was pleased to see Councilmember Katz uh, move this uh, modest proposal forward, recognizing that in order to do the type of deep dive that is required. Uh, with the magnitude of financial impact that a much broader application of these credits would have uh, will take time and we need to do it thoughtfully and we need to do it uh, substantively. Uh, I'm looking forward uh, to uh, working together with uh, 
GEO colleagues uh, uh, as we get that Office of Legislative Oversight report back. Uh, we've worked through various different options. State law now gives us more flexibility than we originally had uh, in terms of uh, how we can uh, move forward with property tax credits and what uh, layers essentially we can uh, put forward to ensure that the property tax credits are going to people who need it uh, and that we are making a choice uh, when we decide these. There are impacts here of who benefits and who doesn't benefit and what the fiscal impact is. Uh, on the county in order to move forward on something that is totally broad based and does not do that type of deep dive, the fiscal impact would be substantial uh, and the benefit would not necessarily be targeted to those uh, who we know need it the most. So uh, absolutely we have major challenges with residents who are trying to age in place and age in community. Uh, and we have an aging population. I Not lost on me, I'm the youngest council member, but I represent the oldest demographic district in the county. So there are more uh, residents in District 1 uh, than, than any other that uh, face this challenge. It's also not lost on me that there's a major disparities in terms of those uh, residents, some who moved in 50, 60 years ago into what was a very modest house uh, that has gone up dramatically in value, uh, and some newer residents who are in far different circumstances for uh, a lot of different reasons. And so tackling that issue in uh, in, in a fair way, in an equitable way, in a way that balances our competing priorities is going to be important and it's something that uh, I'm pleased that we'll be moving forward uh, 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 after uh, the uh, bill uh, is approved, but I am really excited to approve this bill, modest but important, uh, and uh, really applaud uh, uh, our, our colleague, Councilmember Katsu, I will note, uh, I may get older every day, but he is timeless. He is timeless. I won't say he's getting younger, but he doesn't look any older than the day he joined this uh, esteemed body. So with that, I will yield back. Thank you. Well, uh, as the council member of the median age among all 11, I'm not sure how I get pulled into either direction, but uh, tends towards older. Uh, council member Albernas. Thank you. Council President Glass and I are the same age, so I'm <laughs> the same boat. Um, so first, thank you, council member Katz and your team. Uh, thank you to the committee for doing really great work. Thank you for council member Jawando for the very thoughtful uh, amendment and willingness to work collaboratively on addressing this more systemic issue moving forward. And as you acknowledged, and all of us have, the fastest growing demographic we have in our county continues to be our senior population. And as Council Vice President Friedson noted, uh, the property values and the tax assessed values of those homes have gone up exponentially, um, especially over the last 10 years. And by the way, before the body right now is a 10% property tax increase. Um, and so the timing of this is important to help offset some of the impacts that that may have disproportionately on those with fixed incomes. And so uh, there's more that we're gonna need to do in this space and we will need to do it in partnership and collaboration with our, co our colleagues at the state level as well. Um, but it's incumbent upon the, count the county and the council uh, to do all it can to help our, our aging population. And I will uh, second Council Katz's recommendation for 65 plus. I will tell you, the term senior is very loaded. Uh, a number of folks really uh, appreciate um, that title and a number of folks don't. Uh, and so, but for purposes of this particular piece of legislation, I think it's, a, it's important that we clearly articulate from the beginning and in the title uh, who's eligible and who's not. Um, and so I think that's uh, an important thing to note. So with that, I, Mr. President, um, I will yield back to you. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Just wanted to clarify that, that Councilmember Katz did make the motion for the name change. Oh, I, I, did. I will make the motion now. There you go. Very and smooth and seconded by Councilmember Albernaz. Just checking. Uh, Councilmember uh, Mink. Thank you, Council President. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Katz, for this legislation and to the uh, and to the GO Committee for your work on this. Um, I too gave this one a lot of thought, uh, and I'm, and I'm looking forward to like everyone uh, returning this, uh, to this issue to see how we can uh, continue to to improve upon it and make it uh, make the reach more equitable. Um, uh, but I look forward to passing this today. I also wanted to just mention that um, we do have a large, uh, you know, number of residents who are looking to age in place as renters. 
Um, and that is another way that we really need to work to expand the equity of how we are uh, handling the, the housing crisis in front of us. Um, yeah, I, I heard just recently about a um, mom, and I don't know what you say, elderly, senior, 65 plus mom, but who got a, you know, a $50 increase to her rent um, and went ahead and moved in with her kid because that was unaffordable to her. Uh, and that's, that's a, a common story. And so especially as we look at you know, the racial equity implications here before us, we know that a disproportionate number of our renters um, are African American, um, are black and brown, um, and we know that a disproportionate uh, number of our African American residents are renters. So um, I, I think it's going to be important to us to um, have this angle of the conversation, the importance of ensuring that our residents can age in place uh, and make sure that we are applying that to our renters as well. Thank you, I yield. Thank you. Council Member Balcom. Um, thank you. Uh, being on one end of the bell curve, <laughs> I appreciate the discussion. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I support the, the uh, individual 65 and above. Uh, but I also wanted to thank uh, Councilmember Jamando for the for the very thoughtful memo. Um, I I think that when we look at um, the history of the county and uh, who owns house the housing, I think it's really important to do. And I look forward to having that discussion further on down. But thank you for your thoughtful comments. First, let's clear the name change. Uh, it's been motioned and seconded. All those in favor of changing the name of the bill, that is unanimous by all those present. Um, and uh, I'll just close by, you know, agreeing with everything that's been said. And if we are aware of the increasing burden that is being placed on our residents and in particular our homeowners, we need to carry that thought forward into the budget process. And with that, Ma Madam, oh, I need a motion since it's been amended. Is there a motion for the bill? Uh, moved by Council Member Katz, Second. seconded, seconded by <laughs> Council Member, uh, Council Vice President Friedson. Um, Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? Council Member Lukey? Yes. Council Member Lukey votes yes. Council Member Mink? Yes. Council Member Mink votes yes. Council Member Sales? Yes. Council Member Sales votes yes. Council Member Albornoz? Yes. Council Member Albornoz votes yes. Council Member Duwando? Yes. Council Member Duwando votes yes. Council Member Katz? Yes. Council Member Katz votes yes. Council Member Stewart? Yes. Council Member Stewart votes yes. Council Member Balcom? Yes. Council Member Balcom votes yes. Council Member Friesen? Yes. Council Member Friesen votes yes. Council Member Glass? Yes. Council Member Glass votes yes. And that is 10 nothing, unanimous by all those present. Very good. Thank you, Council Member Katz. Uh, we have three more bills for final call. Uh, next one up is Bill 723, Consumer Protection, Gasoline Station Signage. A Public Safety Economic Committee, Joint Committee recommends enactment with amendments. And I will turn it over to the bill sponsor. Uh, I'll turn it over to uh, the chair, Chairman Katz. Actually, I, I think the bill sponsor is the one who's. Sorry. I believe the p bill sponsor is the one who truly should we should turn this over to in the beginning. There we go. Thanks. Bill sponsor, Councilmember Albernas. Uh, well, thank you for allowing mm -hmm. both committees for me to come and crash your party um, and uh, for a, a really great discussion. And at the heart of it, um, this is a consumer protection bill. And I do want to publicly thank the Office of consumer protection, in particular Mr. Friedman and his staff for working with our team. Um, the work of his office is so important and diligent in ensuring that our constituents are protected from all sorts of fraud, but, uh, and while there may not have been very many complaints about this issue, uh, a proactive approach in ensuring and demonstrating to our residents that we are doing all that we can uh, to ensure that they are protected I think is valuable. As we have discussed through this process, uh, some of this jurisdiction crosses over into the state level, but there is an important role for the county to play uh, in advancing this important piece of legislation. My understanding is, is that Councilmember Friedson has an amendment that he'd like to propose, and Councilmember Mink has an amendment to that amendment um, she would like to propose, uh, and just not going to bury the lead, I support both of those amendments. Um, 
And I want to thank everyone for their diligence. Uh, and I also want to thank Ms. Wellens and Ms. Uh, Kristen Tribble in my office who ran point on uh, meeting with a number of the constituencies and stakeholders, um, both in support and then also those that will be impacted um, by this particular piece of legislation. Uh, there were some amendments to provide a longer runway for uh, businesses to be able to um, advance this particular policy. I'll uh, yield back to the president who will, I'm sure, yield to Ms. Wellens uh, to discuss anything that we want to highlight uh, from both committee discussions. Your prescient, Ms. Wellens. Thank you, Council President, and good morning, Council Members. Um, I, I believe that um, Council Member Albernos uh, you know, thoroughly explained uh, the bill and some of the amendments. I'll just uh, recap on, on the amendments uh, that were jointly recommended by the Public Safety and Econ Committees. Uh, there was an amendment to clarify the definition of credit price, an amendment to clarify um, that the bill signage requirements don't apply in a situation in which the credit price and the lowest price are the same. Um, we deleted, the committees deleted some terms that they found to be arguably ambiguous. Uh, the terms were that the, that the signage had to be clearly, clearly, had to be clear and visible um, and at the request of the Office of Consumer Protection. Those terms were deleted to avoid any ambiguity. Um, the um, originally as drafted, the bill would have included a violation of these gas station signage requirements under the list of deceptive, unfair, or unconscionable trade practices under the county law. And um, at the request of the Office of Consumer Protection, the committees uh, removed that from, um, from the list. It's actually a, a, a non-substantive change, but just to uh, preserve the integrity of the list as it was, since it's uh, similar to uh, state and federal, similar state and federal lists. Um, and then as Councilmember Albernos indicated, there was an amendment to an adopt an effective date so six months after the bill becomes law in order to give gas stations a bit more time to, um, you know, get, get everything in line to comply with the new sign requirements. Um, there, I'll, I'll leave it there. I think that, I think that's, I think that covers it. And um, I know there are another, there are additional potential amendments, um, as was indicated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you to uh, Councilmember Albernaz for putting this forward. Uh, I used to work in the regulatory agency at the state that uh, oversaw uh, petroleum uh, uh, regulation, and uh, I do think that this is an issue that residents have uh, expressed uh, some concerns about, and so I appreciate you uh, raising this. Uh, it, it is uh, important. I, I agree that it's a consumer protection issue. Uh, I'm glad we are moving it forward and I am proud to be a co-sponsor uh, 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 or, or to be a supporter of the bill. Uh, I, I did just uh, want to note and I had an amendment and I appreciate your support. Um, we heard from the, the service station owners after the joint committee session and I think it's important to note that most of the service station owners, many of them are immigrant owned small businesses, these are family supporting uh, small businesses, and in order to change one of the large signs in front of these businesses it can cost about $12,000. This is not a, a modest additional expense. And that doesn't include permitting and installation and some of the other associated uh, costs and uh, there are also right now major supply chain issues and other challenges that add to those uh, the costs as well. Uh, I know we're sensitive to that issue. We want to address this uh, problem, and so uh, you know I think it is important to offer an alternative to uh, allow these businesses to comply in a way that is reasonable and not cost prohibitive, particularly at a very challenging uh, uh, time. So. Uh, I uh, shared with colleagues uh, an amendment to amend lines 25 uh, to 33 uh, that would allow for a separate sign visible to uh, motorists. The credit price, uh, there, there has been an issue, and I know there was a discussion during the 
uh, debate uh, or discussion and conversation in the joint committee about uh, making sure that it's not a small, you know, a sign that nobody can see, which is which is important. And so the the words clear and visible were used. There were questions about the ambiguity of a standard that says clear and visible. What's clear and visible? to someone could be not clear uh, or visible to uh, another and so the way that we have uh, attempted to address that is to uh, require that the letters and numerals on the separate sign must appear in the same size and font uh, as those on the signs posted uh, under section 10 uh, 315e of the business regulation article so basically if you have an alternative sign the alternative sign has to have the size of the price uh, the same as it would be, uh, you know, from the uh, you know, overhead uh, overhead sign. So it, it's an alternative, but it's not to uh, uh, diminish uh, the the effort. Uh, the last thing, uh, and 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 I think this is important, and I'm sure we're going to hear from uh, Councilmember Mink as well. The goal here is to provide information to residents to address this consumer protection issue, which is important. Uh, but to do it in a way, I hope, uh, that is not uh, overwhelmingly prohibitive uh, to uh, the uh, business owners. Uh, and to me, the best case scenario here is uh, if, if these business owners can't change their sign, which they've said that there's not space to essentially just add this to an existing sign, they'd have to replace uh, the sign. The goal would be when the, the sign is replaced that they add this, they have a sign that's big enough to accommodate uh, this uh, standard. So we're not prohibitively adding a you know, twelve to $20,000 expense uh, to these businesses. So in the interim, they would have an alternative that has, you know, a, uh, has parity with the size and the font. Uh, so it's, it's just as visible. Uh, and then uh, as they transition uh, and, and you know, have to ultimately replace one of these large signs, which I don't believe are replaced very often, uh, that they uh, ultimately uh, replace it with one that, that complies. So uh, I wanted, uh, w with this, I didn't originally propose this, I appreciate Councilmember Mink raising the, the sunsetting if that is the ultimate goal. Uh, I would propose seven years. Uh, that would you know, provide a long enough runway that the goal is to replace it by adding the size and font uh, to the initial sign that addresses that this isn't a diminished uh, you know, signage. This is similar signage, it just isn't as expensive as the uh, the, the higher uh, uh, you know sign that is uh, you know fixed, it's it's an unfixed sign, uh, and so uh, uh, that was not included in what was shared with colleagues. But I would uh, propose th the amendment as I put forward with the sunset date on this amendment of seven years, so that um, ultimately when they are replaced, this would be the requirement uh, after seven years, uh, not as an alternative. So with that, I will. Move the motion, and I'll yield back. Second, uh, motion's been moved by Council Vice President Friedson, seconded by Council Member Albernaz. Any discussion? Council Member Mink? Yeah, and I, I appreciate uh, Council Vice President Friedson for the thoughtful amendment and for adding the sunset period that we had uh, reached out to ask about. I think that uh, the seven years is a reasonable accommodation looking at, uh, you know, about how regularly they tend to replace their signs uh, and to ensure that we are not levying too great a burden on them, but that we are moving towards uh, making sure that we're satisfying the original intent of the bill. So, appreciate it. Very good. Council Member Balcom. Um, thank you, uh, and thank you for that uh, amendment. I think that's important. Um, uh, Ms. Wallens, can you clarify the implementation date of the bill? Yes, so the implementation date would be six months after the county executive signs the bill into law. So, uh, you know, approximately six months and a few days from now, mm -hmm. um, assuming the council enacts the bill today. Um, and then, um, so that, that's when, if Council Member Friedson's amendment is stopped, you know, that's when this will, um, the requirements will go into effect of at least using a separate sign, either using the state mandated sign or a separate sign with the same size, size and font um, information with the credit card price. So, so that would be six months from now. And then if you, if you adopt this amendment with the sunset period, then within seven years, sure. the information would, the implementation would be that the, that the information has to be on the state mandated sign. And um, I, we, we talked about this during the committee. Um, the uh, notification process, um, I'm assuming that because they 
gas is regulated, highly regulated. Uh, we have the wherewithal to communicate very quickly that this bill is, is passed. I, I believe that's correct. Um, and uh, Mr. Director uh, Friedson, uh, Friedman is here, excuse me, um, from the Office of Consumer Protection. Um, so I know that he spoke during the work session to, you know, efforts to make folks aware. Obviously, there's a lot of education um, that would go into the front end rather than, you know, a harsh enforcement at the outset. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that that's critical because we, we need to, if, if they have six months to comply, because even with a smaller sign, uh, that, I mean, they have to get the sign prepared and designed. And um, so I just, I just encourage uh, that we st start immediately to uh, let people know that this is passed and what the new requirement is. Thank you. Councilmember Al Albernos. Very good point. And uh, as we learn through this process, the Comptroller's Office also plays an important role and has access to the information from a regulatory standpoint. So uh, we will get the word out both um, through the county's own mechanism, but also in partnership with the Comptroller's Office. Very good. Not seeing any other speakers. We have a motion on the floor for the amendment with the seven year sunset. Uh, all, uh, all those in favor? That is unanimous by all those present. Uh, Council Vice President Friedson. Yeah, appre appreciate that. They're absolutely, these should be easy people to reach. There's also a trade association that reached out to us with feedback. I would strongly encourage the executive branch who is here today and, and watching that we should be working not only with the state regulators who obviously have, you know, the state does regular inspections. Uh, um, you know, this is something that happens on a periodic basis. Uh, they're there on, on, you know, th these are the, some of the easiest businesses to, to know where they are and how to contact them. Uh, but also there is, uh, you know, a business association that also has this contact and could be a very helpful partner uh, in making sure that they're aware of their requirements. So I hope that we are exploring both uh, and uh, really appreciate uh, colleague support for that amendment and look forward to approving the bill. Thanks. Councilmember Avalonis, do you have any other comments? Okay, uh, so uh, the bill has been amended on the floor. Is there a motion to so move moved. it? Moved by Councilmember Albernaz, seconded by Councilmember Ludke. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? Councilmember Ludke? Yes. Councilmember Ludke votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz? Yes. Councilmember Albernaz votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Friesen? Yes. Councilmember Friesen votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that bill passes. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we have two more bills and then a bunch of other items still on the agenda. <laughs> Colleagues, before we have a hard stop at 1230, we have uh, other things we're, we're doing today. So uh, Bill 923, Alcohol and Other Drug Use Advisory Council, rename. Uh, the HHS Committee recommends enactment. I'll turn it over to the sponsor and HHS Committee Chair, Councilmember Albernaz. Thank you, Mr. President. And I really want to express my appreciation to the other members of the committee uh, who both asked very excellent questions. There will be some follow-up conversations. Um, based on some of those very thoughtful questions and thoughtful work session. But what before us today seems straightforward, but is much more important than just words on a page. Um, there are three references within the county code, at least, or more, uh, that would be changed uh, to reflect a change from currently calling uh, the Alcohol and other, Dr uh, other Drug Abuse Advisory Council and change the name to Alcohol and Other Drug Addiction Council. Uh, everyone on this dais has been working diligently in a number of different ways uh, to address the rising issues that we've had in our community with alcohol and drug addiction. This is a disease and we have a number of families that have been devastated by this and a number of resources and programs and support systems in place. But one of the most important aspects of addressing this very serious issue is eliminating the stigma and acknowledging that there isn't anyone out there that doesn't know somebody uh, who has experienced these challenges. And so uh, I really want to thank uh, the soon to be named Alcohol and Other Drug Addiction Council 
for their dedication, their leadership, their ability to not just bring these issues to the attention of this body, um, but providing a bridge to the community that is sorely needed at this moment. So uh, the committee voted unanimously for this change. And uh, I don't know if Mrs. Coney, you have any other comments that you'd like to make um, or anything I may have missed. But the council president needs to do that, so I will yield to him <laughs> so he yields to you. He continues to be prescient. Ms. Coney? I have nothing to add. Say, there we go. He, he says it all, uh, and he says it well. Uh, colleagues, any comments? Uh, council member sales um thank you president glass and thank you mr chairman for um making sure that we modernize the language we use to address uh public health issues and as i mentioned during the committee when this was introduced this is a promising first step but i want to make sure that we um uh, uphold our commitment to discuss the next steps and to do the more substantive substantive work to overcome the inequities our black and brown communities face in relation to substance abuse and substance abuse treatment. Today we have identified that drug usage is tied to a pub public health crisis and we are uh, reassessing the ways in which we discuss drug abuse, drug usage as this bill highlights. Um, in our history this crisis was met with fierce outrage and led to mass incarceration that disproportionately harmed our black and brown communities, which resulted in devastating outcomes for these individuals and their families in our communities. I appreciate Councilmember Albernos for suggesting we hold a joint committee session with Public Safety and HHS to revisit this broader issue, to take a deeper dive into our residents that have been negatively affected by our stigmatization around substance abuse and the steps we can take to address it. Thank you, Mr. President. Are you? Uh, thank you, Councilmember Sales. Uh, not seeing any other comments, Madam Clark, please call the roll. Councilmember Lukey? Yes. Councilmember Lukey votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernos? Yes. Councilmember Albernos votes yes. Councilmember Dewando? Yes. Councilmember Dewando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Malcolm? Yes. Councilmember Malcolm votes yes. Councilmember Friedson? Yes. Councilmember Friedson votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous by all present. And the third, uh, the fourth and final bill uh, is Bill 1023, Health, Intellectual, and De Developmental Disabilities Commission established. HHS committee recommends enactment with amendments. Uh, his third bill of the morning. Let's see if he gets that hat trick. Uh, the HHS chair and bill sponsor, Council Member Albernas. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. First, thank you to colleagues who unanimously uh, co-sponsored this important piece of legislation. Uh, as we heard through the passionate testimony in the public hearing and many of the conversations we've had over many years uh, with our friends in the intellectual and developmental disability community, uh, there are co a complex series of policy issues, of programmatic challenges, and of real life challenges that face this community every day. And we have been fortunate that the Commission for People with Disabilities has tackled many and most of these issues for many years, um, there has been a recognition that there is a need to have a specialized and more direct focus and approach uh, so that this body, the county executive, but also our state legislature is put in a better position as we discuss budget, as we go through policy uh, objectives, as we look at challenges in the community uh, to be able to address those in a manner that is holistic and comprehensive. Um, I especially um, want to give a shout out to my Chief of Staff, Beth Schumann, uh, who worked closely with the Commission for People with Disabilities and the stakeholders and the nonprofit organizations to uplift this important initiative, but also do it in a way that was thoughtful, that heard concerns, uh, and that uh, really met this moment. And so 
there is still much work to be done, and the most important component of this will be enacting the recommendations of this particular commission. Um, but this represents an important change moving forward uh, that will help not just improve the quality of life of many of our residents, but dare I say, save the life of many of our residents. So thank you very much to colleagues for supporting this. And with that, Mr. President, I yield back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Council Vice President Friedson. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you to uh, Chair Albernaz for moving this forward. This is really important. And I uh, just wanted to note, uh, when I uh, worked on the ABLE program, Achieving Better Life Experiences program at the state level, launching that program to help people with disabilities and families of those uh, individuals live more financially independent and secure lives when we launched it nationally, serving on a national working group. One of the obvious takeaways from that process was that there were a lot of similarities between the IDD community and the broader disability community, uh, but there were a lot of differences too. And we had to treat those uh, issues and understand how this program was going to work separately to really uh, make sure that it was serving everybody in the community. And it really spoke to the fact that uh, having a separate seat at the table as uh, an advocacy organization that is charged with providing advice and counsel to the county council and the county executive uh, is really critical that there are a lot of things that bring these communities together and a lot of overlap, but there are a lot of unique characteristics of uh, the families and individuals uh, who are working on these issues and having a separate formal institutional organization that is set up to do this work is really going to be crucial as we move forward with the type of inclusive community that we're trying to achieve. So uh, kudos to you for being such a great champion uh, on these uh, issues and supporter uh, of this community. Uh, thank you to Beth Schumann in your office who, 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 as you noted, did such a great job. And I am just really excited uh, to be able to move this uh, effort forward and to be able to support you in this critical work. So thank you for your leadership. Councilmember Lutke. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Chair Abernaz. And, and I just want to speak to the amendment that we, we've proposed um, from, the, from the committee and why it's so critically important because, you know, as, as already discussed, um, this community uh, has such subject matter expertise that is, is above and beyond um, the overall general disabilities community. And I truly have appreciated the advocacy that they generally have been doing at the local, state, and federal levels. Um, and we needed to make sure that they could do that without hesitation and without restraint or receiving other um, uh, blessing um, within the county before being able to go ahead and do that should they choose to do so on particular topics as a as a public body. So I am grateful uh, for for the creation of this commission and I look forward to their work in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I will just uh, uh, extend my appreciation to Councilmember Albernaz on on the creation of this commission as well. Uh, we value uh, community input and uh, stakeholder support in all of our work. Uh, it is a team effort and if there are voices that we have not heard from, uh, we are making sure we hear from them and that is what this commission is all about. Uh, not seeing any other speakers, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Lukey? Yes. Councilmember Lukey votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz? Yes. Councilmember Albernaz votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Friedson? Yes. Councilmember Friedson votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous by all those present. Uh, congratulations on the hat trick. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, moving on, we're now going to sit as district council. We will be introducing two different items during this district council. First, the introduction of subdivision regulation amendment 30, uh, 2301. Administrative Subdivision Mixed Use Housing Community. A public hearing is scheduled for May 2nd at 1.30 and a Planning Housing Parks Committee work session will be scheduled at a later date. This is being introduced by Council Members Sales and Vice President Friedson and 
uh, co-sponsored by Council Members Ludke and Stewart. Council Member Sales. Uh, thank you, President Glass. Um, I wanted to take a moment to thank Council Vice President Friedson for working with me um, on expanding the work he spent much of last year fine-tuning to make this ZTA possible. I know that it will shock no one when it comes to the affordable housing crisis um, and um, knowing that we need to increase our supply in Montgomery County. And it was a key part of my SMART agenda. As we continue the discussions um, in this body on how to increase the stock of affordable housing, we must ensure that we um, do all we can to ensure that we're not creating food deserts or commercial dead zones. We must do this in a way that promotes complete communities. The Opening Pathways of Economic Necessity, ZTA, um, short, open for short, um, to shorten the acronym, is the companion legislation to the SRA, which addresses concerns for the development community about long site plan approval times and cutting that time frame by up to 75% if the developers are willing to meet certain criteria, including an increased number of affordable units and commercial requirements. This SRA, along with its sister ZTA, will make it easier for developers to make whole developments like Pike and Rose and Crown um, that ensure a healthy mix of housing and supporting commercial businesses. I look forward to the exciting possibilities that can be brought by such a significant reduction in site plan approval timelines and we'll continue to work on creative ways to increase our affordable housing supply and economic mobility for every resident who calls our county home. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield. Thank you, Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you, Council Member Sales. Really appreciate uh, your work and partnership uh, on this uh, issue. Uh, it's part of a broader goal here to address our housing crisis and our affordable housing crisis. Colleagues, in a nutshell, this zoning text amendment and the accompanying SRA is about production of affordable housing. We need more housing for more residents to seriously address our COG housing targets. And mirroring zoning text amendment 2109 that was passed by the last council to boost our ability to attract biohealth companies, this zoning text amendment incentivizes projects with substantial amounts of affordable income restricted units by significantly accelerating the regulatory review process by as much as 75%, as you heard from Council Member Sales. The PHE Committee has had several substantive conversations about housing affordability, culminating yesterday with the launch of an effort to further refine our housing targets with geographic areas, as has been done recently in the District of Columbia. Without knowing where we need to go in terms of the number of units needed to promote anything close to economically integrated communities, we're essentially shooting in the dark. But one thing we know is true, and we talked about yesterday, we need more tools, not fewer, to achieve our housing targets. We need more affordable housing, and we need more housing. This legislation offers another tool in our toolkit. It embraces a carrot approach, and it hopefully sends the message that if you are willing to build significant amounts of affordable housing that we so desperately need in Montgomery County, that we will work with you, we will help you, we will make it easier for you to do it. If you want to invest in our affordable housing crisis and help more residents be part of inclusive mixed income communities, we should be rolling out the red carpet for you and that's what this effort essentially does. I really appreciate Councilmember Sales again for your leadership. I thank Council Members Lukey and Stewart for your co-sponsorship. Uh, really appreciate us moving this forward. The fact remains that we have an affordable housing crisis in Montgomery County that can't be solved without accelerating the production of housing uh, in the county, and we need to employ every single tool at our disposal in order to address it. And this 
legislation and the accompanying uh, SRA uh, with the ZTA will allow us to move in that direction to reach our local and regional goals. And with that, uh, we yield back to you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Sales and Vice President Friedson for introducing the SRA. I'd like to be listed as a co-sponsor. Not seeing any other comments. Uh, uh, Ms. Nadu, any other thoughts from you? Um, well, one thing I will add, so the, what the ZTA will do is provide the expedited approval process, and then the reason for the SRA is in case an applicant also needs to go through the subdivision process to make sure that the two timelines align. But other than that, I think everything has been said. There you go. So with that, the SRA has been introduced, and now we will formally introduce the Zoning Text Amendment 2302 Regulatory Approvals, Mixed Use Housing Community. Lead sponsors again are Councilmember Sales and Vice President Friedson with co-sponsors Ludke and Stewart. Public hearing is scheduled for May 2nd at 1.30, and a Planning, Heart, Planning Housing Parks Committee work session is scheduled for a later date, uh, and I would like to be added as a co-sponsor of that. Councilmember Sales. Um, thank you, President Glass. Um, I will just um, echo the comments made by my co-sponsor and want to thank um, uh, our other co-sponsors, Council Member Stewart and Council Member Lukey, and thank you, President Glass, for um, your sign on. And just want to invite um, any of the co-sponsors to make any additional comments and also want to thank Ms. Levu for the incredible amount of work she put in to coordinate and get this ready before we enter budget season. So thank you so much for your support and collaboration, um, your entire department and my colleagues, and really excited to introduce this legislation. Thank you, Council Vice President. Uh, yeah, well, I wanted to thank Ms. Nadu, so I appreciate you doing that. I also want to thank the planning Department, their team worked very closely with Ms. Nadu and with our teams in order to move uh, this proposal forward. And I just wanted to uh, make sure that colleagues were aware uh, the requirement is 50% affordable uh, at the MPDU level uh, or 35% affordable if at least 15% is at deeply affordable 30% area median income uh, levels. So uh, it, uh, it, as introduced, offers uh, a choice uh, and uh, would you know, significantly help us to address uh, our affordable housing goals. So with that, I'll yield back to you and appreciate everybody's support. Very good. And with that, that ZTA has been introduced. Thank you very much, colleagues. Okay. Looking at the time, just reminding everybody that we have a hard stop at 1230. And so right now we will go into a work session on CIP amendments for the FY23 to 28 capital improvement program. Uh, we will start with items in the Public Safety Committee, and I will turn it over to Chairman Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I heard you loud and clear about the hard <laughs> stop. You're so subtle, very subtle. I want to once again publicly thank Ms. Farag for her thorough and complete packet. Uh, on March the 13th, the Public Safety Committee voted three to zero. Uh, and concurred with the county executive's recommendations with exception of keeping White Flint Fire Station on current schedule. Two days later, two days later, the county executive sent over additional amendments in his March 15th packet that includes new changes to White Flint and the Outdoor Firearms Training Center, and these will be reviewed during the operating budget work sessions. Um, if you would like me to go through number as we go through for uh, uh, item number five, the Montgomery County Detention Center partial demolition and renovation, the planning design and renovation of uh, MCDC at Seven Locks Road, construction should be completed this spring. Total project cost reduced by a million dollars to reflect the savings. On uh, number six, the pre-release center uh, dietary facilities improvement. The project completed 2019. It's been, the, the pre-release center has been closed since the pandemic, though it's getting ready to be re reopen. Uh, reflects funding switch and state aid. The project received about $450,000 less than anticipated. The pre-release center expected to reopen April 16th. Uh, pre-release and re-entry services programs and pre-release center is going to be celebrating its 50th 
anniversary and we're very proud of that facility uh, this year. Um, for number seven, the apparatus replacement program is an ongoing project. It provides ongoing replacement of fire apparatus and EMS vehicles. The intention is to provide a steady and continuous flow of funding for minimum replacement needs and it uses a mix of current revenue. Uh, its recent supplemental appropriation and amendment to the CIP, the Council just reviewed and approved a $4.2 million supplemental appropriation that permits the county to encumber funds for vehicles with long lead times. And uh, the proposed amendment appropriates FY25 short-term financing to ensure it can support additional purchases of a needed uh, uh, apparatus and it recommends approval as submitted by the executive. For number eight, the fire station life safety systems, ongoing funding to provide fire stations with fire alarms with voice capability, sprinkler and fire suppression systems, smoke detection flow, et cetera. Minor expenditure acceleration shifting $13,000 from FY23 to FY22, and the savings in the one project allowed another one to start early. Number nine, Rockville Fire Station, uh, and number three for renovations, partial funding for renovations to fire station interior and exterior for $500,000. Funds were deferred until FY25 due to project delays. White Flint Fire Station number 23, this, there again it was the uh, CE Center for Additional Amendments on March 15th and we'll be discussing that at that point, but this is a new five bay uh, station for Rockville slash White Flint area. It's a project delay has been delayed numerous times over the past eight years. The project cost has increased $10.4 million due to net zero requirements, design changes, and an added police station. Relocation of this station will better serve, <coughs> excuse me, the high density area and larger size will meet increased service demands. The county executive recommends another year delay with project completion pushed to spring of 2027. The committee concurs with council staff to keep the project on its current schedule. And uh, number 11, the uh, Public Safety Training Academy building complex has been closed out. The expenditures reduced by $1.2 million to reflect project savings. And the number 12 Outdoor Firearms Training Center, there again in that March 15th packet, then included uh, information from that as well. That is a 40-year facility in Poolsville. It's used for ongoing weapons training for the police department. This, there is site safety concerns, especially degradation of the berms. The county executive has re recommended a two-year delay for fiscal capacity. Project has been, been delayed several times already. And of course, we need the outdoor facility for mock scenario training. Committee concerned about ongoing delays, reluctantly agreed to current recommended delay, plan on detailed discussion of this project in next year's full CIP review. And with that, I turn it back to you, Mr. President. And with that, and with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Farrick if you have any additional comments. Uh, thank you, I don't. Um, Chair Katz covered it all. So As he always does. Well, she wrote it. Appreciate the credit. There you go. Good job, team. Team. Thank you. Thank you. Public much. safety. Uh, <laughs> council member, uh, Council Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you uh, to the public safety chair for reading so eloquently. <laughs> uh, always uh, appreciate when you have the courage and conviction to agree with Susan Ferrick. Um, I had a question about the White Flint Fire Station. Uh, you know, I, I just I, I want to note this, and I appreciate all of uh, Councilmember Stewart's leadership uh, in representing this area. As everybody knows, I represent this area for four years. One of the first things that we talked about in beginning this co-location conversation with the bill that had just passed was this specific site. And I've talked with the county executive. I've talked with the executive branch, uh, and we keep hearing that there is going to be a plan for co-location. Uh, of this site that the county executive is committed to co-location of housing at this site but as far as I can tell there's no plan there's no thought process here I just want to note it's in a strategic location in 
an area that we are banking a lot of our economic development on, where the county executive, to his credit, has really focused on, which I really do appreciate, that uh, its new terrific council member has, uh, has, has uh, taken the ball and run with it, with all of the exciting uh, opportunities and efforts that we have here. It's an urbanizing area. It's focused on economic development. It is at the intersection of Josiah Henson Parkway and 355, where a future bus rapid transit uh, network uh, is and we are looking at requesting tens of millions of dollars in state and federal support for infrastructure that we want to build out this critical area for our housing and economic development needs and here we have a county controlled site that has been at the heart of a conversation that started with my predecessor on the previous council when he looked at co-location of housing on county owned sites that we've been talking about for for five years to look at opportunities for co-location of housing and so i just wanted to find out you know where are we on that what is the plan for that and how are we going to move forward on that director director dice. david dice director of department of general services uh some months ago uh, department of general services uh along with partnership with dot uh, offered a number of county-owned sites uh, for uh, proposals for affordable housing. Um, two of the most promising, uh, and probably the most promising, of the proposals that we received was for the White Flint site. Uh, a, 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 the county executive has selected an offer, and we hope to be issuing a public announcement to that effect very shortly. We're just trying to work out the details with that partner and uh, which, which would fully develop a um, five-story facility um, in that order, uh, uh, housing uh, development on that site that the county owns adjacent, immediately adjacent to the fire station. So an announcement is forthcoming. There has been a selection and it will be proceeding. Okay, just so I'm sure, there, there's going to be a co-location of housing on the site or adjacent to the site? Well, the county owns the site immediately to be occupied by the fire station and the parcel uh, next to that, which would allow for a full uh, uh, maximized use of housing on that site. As you'll recall, C Council Member Friedson, we looked at putting housing above the fire station, but that was impractical, and so uh, we focused on that adjacent property and we have an uh, excellent proposal that we'll be uh, announcing shortly. Do you have an estimate of how many units that would be? Do uh, It's Good morning, Greg Austin, Department of General Services. Uh, it's more than 100 units. We're, we're fine-tuning it. Um, it's a different construction type that's being proposed, and so we're trying to work our way through that to make sure that it, uh, when we do make an announcement that it's a real announcement. And uh, as uh, Director Dice, uh, mentioned uh, the number of stories and number of units are pertinent to that point. So we'll, we'll, we'll need to circle back with you on exactly how many units, um, but that'll all be forthcoming in fairly short order. In terms of fairly short order, could you give a time Matter frame of weeks. for weeks? Weeks. So the council will receive notification specifically of what this project Absolutely. will look like Absolutely. within weeks. Sure. Yeah, and you'll see it as a property disposition as well. Um, because it's going to need to go through the, the county's disp disposition process. So you'll, you'll have all of the details and, and, and then some uh, very shortly. Okay. I hope before there's a press conference and a public announcement that the council is made aware and consulted. Uh, and so I appreciate that we're finally moving forward on something there. I will reserve judgment on whether it is uh, adequate, and I look forward to working with the district council member for that area to make sure that it serves the needs of that community. But I just wanted to raise that because it's been an ongoing uh, issue. So uh, thank you for the response. I'll yield back, Mr. President. Thank you. Not seeing any other comments. Um, uh, council member Jawanda. Just so I understand the process, are we going, we're on five, five at this point? Or are uh, we we're five through 12. But we're going um, all yep. right. So we, we just went through, through the committee work. That, right, exactly. So on the what impact does what was just shared, which I, I also look forward to hearing about, um, what does that have on what the, uh, the committee's action take to not accept the, re the reduction around White Flint? Uh, Rachel Silverman with OMB. The, the affordable housing timeline is not 
not, not connected. Connected okay. to they're on adjacent but not the same side. And so could you yeah, they're not on the same side as we just heard, so they're adjacent. And uh, and so could you just just describe for me I didn't have the benefit of the full committee discussion I read the packet but of the reasoning for delaying that again right so so as um, the council is aware we were confronting a number of um, challenges putting together the CIP particularly around the front loading of the MCPS requests as well as inflationary impacts in other public safety areas not in the fire department particularly and so in order to balance all of the needs that the county executive was uh, facing and putting together we had to really limit um, our attention in delays to those projects that had not yet entered construction and unfortunately this is is one of those projects one of the few projects that we had um, that we really could could move in terms of schedules got it and what would the the recommended move would would have done what uh, this recommended deferral defers the project completion by one year there was a subsequent uh, county executive amendment that came over March 15th which will be discussed by the committee at a later date that defers it an additional year as a result of um, uh, recordation tax decreases that we had to recognize in the March transmission okay. and the recommendation of the committee was to not accept that re referral deferral correct Ms. Fry okay um, and at a cost and that's all in 24 uh, it's it's cascading well, okay so, but right. this, it starts in 24 the, uh, yeah, it would um, if the executives proposed amendment were adopted it would shift about five million from FY 24 to free up some capacity in 24 and it would shift it to 25 delaying construction and completion by about a year okay right. and do we and we have the fire so could you just talk about the from your perspective sir uh, and introduce yourself what the impact uh, uh, good morning Gary Cooper division chief of fine rescue uh, we understand the uh, the position however we're disappointed and we're having a problem now keeping up with the response demands and the further we push out the construction the higher the demand and the less our ability is to meet the requirements all right. Well, I, I appreciate that, and, and uh, you know, obviously, the CIP is tough all around. And if we keep, um, you know, as education committee chair, I have to remind my colleagues: is we we keep it's all the same pot. And if we keep adding things back, we're going to have to, you know, there's going to be tough decisions, and, and we're going to have to figure out how to do this. So, uh, appreciate the discussion and appreciate the um, uh, the explanation. Thank you. Thank you, and look forward to getting the update on those parcels and what is to come uh, on the be built on those parcels very much so um, not seeing any of the comments uh, this is a work session so uh, no additional feedback right now thank you um, uh, next is uh, economic development committee uh, CIP on digital equity and Montgomery connects uh, the chair of the committee, uh, Councilmember Fani Gonzalez, is not with us right now, so uh, I will just very briefly introduce the item, which is uh, $1,977,000 in FY23 and $4,680,000 in FY24 for the uh, Digital Equity Montgomery Connects program, which uh, this is the first time that this is coming before the Economic Development Committee. It used to be in the Fed Committee, but with the addition of the commi new committees, uh, we split up some of the portfolios and some of the CIP priorities. Um, Dr. Torregas, you want to explain this item? Yes. Um, this uh, uh, amends the 2023-2028 uh, initial proposal of the executive by shifting some monies out uh, is heavily dependent on state funding and federal funding. Uh, TEPS has been great at finding uh, federal and state funding. Uh, so this uh, recognized the fact that the money didn't come in uh, fiscal uh, 23, as they were hoping, so it's pushed out to fiscal 24. The digital equity uh, initiative is a very important one to TEPS and to the county executive. So the Econ Committee uh, recommended uh, unanimously uh, its approval. Very good. Uh, appreciate that synopsis. I don't see any comments from colleagues. So we will uh, tacitly 
express our support for that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Torregas. Uh, and then lastly is technology services within the Government Operations Committee uh, and Chair Stewart. Great. There are just two items here. One is the business continuity phase two. This project pro provides funding for phase two of the county's business continuity program. The business continuity phase one was funded in the fiber network project to maintain and strengthen the county's cyber security defenses and resiliency. This request mitigates potential risk and facilita uh, facilitates cost avoidance. The GO Committee reviewed this important project on December 8th in detail and in a closed session, and the full council agreed with the amendment on their December 13th um, session. The submission of the project in the 2023-2028 recommended amendment simply integrates the committee and the full council's decision into the formal CIP program. The second item is a county re radio replacement and related equipment. The county uh, radio and replacement related equipment project is complete. The original intent was to upgrade radios in use by the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation as well as the Department of Transportation in order to bring them up to required national standards. There is no funding recommended for this program going forward as all tasks have been completed. There is currently an unencumbered balance of $293,000, which the executive would like to transfer to the Public Safety System Modernization Project. And that will be re reviewed by the Public Safety Committee at a later date. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Tregas. It was an excellent overview. <laughs> As she always does. Uh, don't see any other call, uh, comments from colleagues. Oh, Council Member Sales. Um, thank you, President Glass. I just had a question about, um, you know, this is a significant amount of resources and I know that IT is very expensive. Will this uh, be used to enhance our cybersecurity system? Wh which item are you referring to? Well, for the, um, the funding breakdown that is the... Uh, the so business continuity, I, I yes, think it. yes. So the business continuity is is almost solely uh, dedicated to um, cybersecurity. The change from uh, years past is that uh, TEBS is uh, attempting to create an enterprise-wide, as they call it, or county-wide cybersecurity system, as opposed to individual departments worrying about their own cybersecurity. This is why business continuity is so important. So you're absolutely right. It has to do with strengthening cybersecurity. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Uh, not seeing any other comments or questions. I think we're good with this particular item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. And with that, we go on to item number 15, which is an interview with the county executive's appointment of a special projects manager in the office of the county executive. And that is an interview with somebody who is no stranger to this chamber. Welcome, Mr. Rice. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I will allow Mr. Madalino to make an introduction. Thank you very much, Mr. President, members of the council. Um, as uh, the council president just said, everyone here knows Craig Rice. Um, I have had the honor to know Craig for almost two decades, served with Craig in the General Assembly, and of course, um, together uh, with his role in the county council and then the last several years with my return to the county. He has done an amazing job representing the people of Montgomery County. Um, his efforts, um, his in-depth knowledge of a number of subjects have led him to serve on important state and national leadership roles. I had the honor to serve on the Kerwin Commission with him where he represented the interests of the Maryland Association of Counties. So um, when uh, we were considering the special projects manager position um, and thank you all very much for your support of that um, the county executive could think of no one better in the in the county who was ready to take on the the role that we have outlined and discussed with you around um, issues of close clothing the closing the digital divide and um, with his experience at the state level his experience at the national level and as we were we were talking between his his engagement with our new governor um, with his um, many meetings at the White House. He provides a connection into um, some of the decision makers 
um, uh, that uh, we have not had, and um, a fami familiarity deeply with the policy issues and with our community and where the needs are. So um, that's why we're so excited that he was willing to join the administration, and I hope all of you will um, have the same excitement the executive and I have with Craig um, joining the administration and support his uh, confirmation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rice, you know I have a few questions for you. I don't know if you have something you want to say at the beginning. No? And we'll hop right into it. Uh, and colleagues and Mr. Rice, we do uh, have a hard stop. Uh, because of another commitment, so I just remind everybody of that. Um, if you could tell us what in your background and qualifications makes you an ideal candidate for the role of spe Special Projects Manager in our county. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you to the members of the council as well. I also want to thank uh, the CAO as well as the county executive for this honor. As you know, my name is Craig Rice. I'm a former state delegate, former Montgomery County Council member, former co-chair of the National Association of Counties Broadband Task Force, and former member of the Maryland Broadband Advisory Workgroup. I'm also the creator of the Ignite Hub, a collaboration between Montgomery College, MCPS, Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation, and Apple. And I've touched broadband and digital equity issues at the federal, state, and local levels, like you heard from Mr. Madalino. But my passion for digital career pathways started a long time ago, and I think it's important for folks to understand. I was one of 100 students in Montgomery County that was admitted to the first math, science, computer science magnet program that began at Tacoma Park Intermediate School. And it was there that my love for technology uh, and technological spaces began. But the reality was is that I saw that I was only one of three black students in that program at Montgomery Blair High School. Um, and uh, the reality is is there were so many other non-magnet students that were at Blair that also shared the same acumen uh, for computers and science that I had and the same want to be in that space. And so I knew that those inequities existed then. And so most recently, when the National Association of Counties asked me to be the co-chair of the Broadband Task Force that would make recommendations not only to jurisdictions across the country, but to the White House as well, I wanted to answer the call because it was important for me to make sure that we worked on these issues, not just here in Montgomery County, not just in the state of Maryland, but across the nation, recognizing the importance of broadband expansion I will tell you that my passion for digital equity, coupled with my educational experience, majoring in computer science, my corporate connections, as well as my political relationships at the federal, state, and local levels, have me uniquely positioned to serve in this role. Thank you. Can you share with us your ideas for undertaking the tasks described in the executive's transmittal for the new position, which include coordinating efforts to extend the physical infrastructure needed to access high-speed broadband to every corner of the county, ensuring every resident has the tools they need to leap the digital divide, including access to affordable high-speed broadband, a home computer, and digital, digital literacy training, strategically seeking and deploying grants, establishing a network of digital navigators, and lastly, creating a comprehensive online digital literacy resource portal. So I'm going to take them a little bit out of order, if that's OK. okay. Yes. And, um, There's a lot there. <laughs> there is. There is. But it's all good stuff. Uh, leveraging federal government grants through NTIA, or the National Telecommunications Information Association, uh, with state grants from the Office of Statewide Broadband, private sector philanthropy, uh, Combining all of those together, we can really start to ensure that every single resident not only has access to high-speed, affordable broadband in their homes, but also that everyone has a device and the knowledge and skills to actually use them. Uh, this includes partnering with organizations like Housing Opportunities Commission. Uh, that has done a great job in one of their sites where they actually provided a relationship with Comcast that gave those individuals devices as well as the Internet Essentials program. The reality is we have the opportunity to do that throughout this county. As I just heard you talking about affordable housing and the multitude of projects that are coming online, working with those developers to make sure that we are harnessing uh, the ability to be able to provide those services for our residents are crucial. And it is 
definitely uh, something that we need to make sure that our ISPs, our internet service providers, Comcast, Verizon, uh, Cox and others uh, come to the table and are there with us as we try to make sure that we truly leap this digital divide. Now I will tell you that when it comes to strategically uh, seeking and deploying the grants, that's also included in what I was talking about before. You just heard um, from Mr. Tregas about some of the challenges that we face. This is a very competitive market now. Everyone understands how important it is for connectivity. TEPS has done an amazing job. Mitzi Herrera, Joe Webster, and of course, Director Roper uh, have been phenomenal at fighting for every single dollar but there's more that we can do once we start knocking on some of the doors and really working some of those relationships. Some of the time that they don't have is they're also trying to manage these programs and so that's incredibly important. Digital Skills Portal. Um, we have our, and are uniquely positioned with Montgomery College and with Montgomery County Public Schools who have actually done a phenomenal job during COVID at setting up digital skills platforms for parents and for teachers and for students. The reality is we need to take that countywide to every single one of our residents, making sure that we work with all of our educational institutions to stand up a county portal that is accessible to every single one of our residents. We also need to ensure that there's universal, reliable, affordable broadband uh, that's going to require multiple technological solutions. We've got to be creative and think outside of the box. It is not just providing broadband uh, and fiber to every single home. It's about utilizing satellite technology, utilizing cellular and fixed wireless, uh, making sure that we talk about innovations like micro trenching that are less invasive and more affordable when it comes to connecting units. Uh, and again, our relationships with the providers, uh, both the large ones and the smaller ones, will allow us to creatively ensure our community needs are met. Last but certainly not least is our establishment of digital navigators, and this is an exciting one. Governor Westmore had proposed a new initiative called the Serve Act, and that would have high school students serve a year with a nonprofit institution. Just last month, I reached out to the governor and had a conversation with him directly uh, to actually seek approval for that to extend to digital navigators as well. Making sure that we can say there's a way in which both accomplishments are done. Uh, we were successful in utilizing the same model during the COVID pandemic. And in addition, millions of dollars have been set aside at the state level to help pay for digital navigators. And we are uniquely positioned with the Ignite Hub and with Montgomery College to make that happen here. Thank you. Thorough response to a multi-layered question. Um, next question, if appointed, how do you plan to collaborate with the Department of Technology and Enterprise Services, otherwise known as TEBS, uh, their implementation of Montgomery Connects, which is the county's digital equity and inclusion program. You know, this is really important. And uh, as I highlighted with Director Roper and uh, Mr. Webster and Ms. Herrera, um, collaboration is key when it comes to making strides when it comes to digital equity. I want to be very clear when I say I'm not going to duplicate or supplant the work of TEBS, but rather work in synergy with them. I've collaborated with Ms. Herrera many times in my role as the NACO lead for broadband and have collaborated with the White House uh, visit to our upcounty hub to witness the distribution of free computers and the affordable connectivity sign up program. Uh, it, is all, it was also an opportunity for us at that time to demonstrate why the federal government should invest more money in Montgomery County because of the great things and the accomplishments that TEBS is doing. More of that high-level interaction within my networks, including the Biden-Harris administration, as well as the Moore administration, and the General Assembly, of which I still have relationships, to get more funding for digital equity training programs for low-income uh, urban and rural residents and to shape the grant decisions behind those is incredibly important. We need someone with relationships with Montgomery County businesses to make sure that private philanthropy is coming in for digital equity as well. We need to promote healthcare and tech companies that we have great ones here to make sure that they're focusing on telehealth. And I'm looking at the chair of the Health and Human Services Committee because he knows all too well about the importance of this. But the reality is, is that we even have organizations like the U.S. Naval Surface Warfare Center in Bethesda that is interested in partnering with us to ensure that we can get our children into those career pathways. Um, Montgomery Connects is doing a great job. 
but we need more funding to be able to offer more programs to more people and in a targeted way, utilizing our nonprofits that we have here in the community to get to our hard reach communities. And lastly, but certainly not least, and I'm sorry, this is really important, Montgomery County Public Schools offers computers to students. And that's great. But the same students come to the county asking for the computers because MCPS takes them back in the summer or you know they have policies that are not conducive to consistent access. I need to work with WorkSource Montgomery, Montgomery College, MCPS to make sure that we have a cohesive way in which we can ensure that those uh, devices are provided for all of our residents. Very good, thank you. Uh, if appointed, how would you position this role to work on racial equity and social justice issues? So digital equity at its core is the expansion of affordable and reliable high-speed internet access coupled with devices and digital skills to make sure that underrepresented communities and populations, including low-income households, veterans, aging individuals, racial and ethnic minorities, rural residents, and others ties directly to racial equity and social justice. Virtual education, remote work, and telehealth have become essential parts of daily life. So, so many now turn to the internet in order to order groceries or meals, access government services, uh, and stay in touch with family members. During COVID, MCPS took drastic steps like supporting distance learning by supplying MiFi hotspots to homes that needed stronger connections. And while this was a quick fix for some, the reality is, is that so many were still so far left behind. So what does that mean? Well, we know our black and Latinx adults are almost twice as likely as white adults to actually lack uh, broadband access. So all of those things that I talked about, everything from e-commerce to telehealth to just trying to apply for a job now that is online is actually denied to so many. And due to those systemic inequalities, education and employment, uh, people who are black or Latinx have lower average incomes than white people. And for many of those households, a broadband subscription that averages about $68 a month is just simply unaffordable. I heard a conversation earlier, and I think it was Councilmember Mink that was talking about how $50 made a difference when it comes to rent. Well, this is the same thing here. And people are gonna make a decision not to have that if we don't provide them the opportunities. I understand the presumption of the racial equity analysis of this position that stated one person will not likely be able to make an impact on racial equity and goals for the entire county. Typically, that would be true. But I will tell you that we are uniquely positioned in this moment and it paints a different narrative. Based on the work that Tebs behind me has already put forth, and the blueprint that I've kind of laid out, I feel that together we can make strides in fostering greater digital equity for our most vulnerable and marginalized residents. Thank you. Last question from me. Are there any potential conflicts of interest of which we should know about? No. Very good. I will turn it over to the council member from Montgomery County's second district. <laughs> council member Balcom. Great, thank you. Um, uh, thank you. I was going to say council member, thank you, uh, <laughs> Mr. Rice, um, for your public service. I, I'd like to say that I knew Craig Rice before he was actually Craig Rice. Uh, so we go way, way back. We were in the trenches together uh, in Germantown. So thank you for your uh, you. very long years of ser service. You spoke briefly about this, but I, I would like to talk about geography. Mm -hmm. um, you know very well that not all parts of the county are the same. Um, throughout COVID, there was a concerted effort to get broadband connection uh, to everyone, uh, uh, particularly in the Ag Reserve. However, we still have over 80 households without broadband of any kind. Um, so, and most, if not all, are in District 2. Some may be in District 7. Uh, can you go into a little bit more detail about how we can reach everyone in the county and uh, and also to increase speed because even people who are connected don't have speed and reliability. So thank you. Well, thank you very much for that question, uh, Council Member Balcom. And let me just say that uh, I couldn't agree with you more. It's one of the reasons why I was so passionate about this when it started. Look, we know that there is an issue. Uh, we have 83 properties in our agricultural reserve currently uh, that are underserved that we've identified. The reality is, is the number may be larger. Uh, you know, and, and, and when it comes to actual service, uh, having service and having service that meets the needs of you and your family are 
completely different things as well. Uh, working with the FCC and digital mapping, we're starting to be able to now, and this is why it's really important for us, uh, myself working with HEBS, working with the federal government, uh, the FCC is asking for information on where our most underserved residents are. We need to make sure that that information is accurate, uh, that it's given to them so that then we can direct funnel resources to make sure that those particular areas are highlighted as priorities without having any type of service right now. Um, the reality is, is that they're expensive um, to get to those last, uh, those last mile uh, homes, um, but that doesn't mean that we still shouldn't do it. We know the importance and what it means to us when it comes to our economy, but also when it comes to equity. Uh, and it really is one of the reasons why I think using some of the creative models that we have, whether it's utilizing micro-trenching, whether it's utilizing our satellite technology, um, other types of devices that are out there that now give us the ability to deliver high-speed internet access uh, to those individuals should be a priority for us. Um, but I will say this, uh, there are also other areas in your district that are similar in nature. Uh, when I look at areas, and I know that you kind of border Montgomery Village now, it used to be a little bit larger, um, but in those areas, in some of the Darnstown areas, um, we see the same effects. Uh, the reality is, is that these pockets go throughout the county, and it really is going to take us getting that federal money, uh, asking for that support to come in to actually help to deliver that service for those individuals. I wish there was some magic uh, way in which we could do it, but it's actually going to be very basic, uh, and it's gonna require a lot of elbow grease in terms of convincing folks at the state and federal level that this is the right thing to do. I will tell you that just very quickly, and I know we're pressed on time, uh, Council President, but um, when it came to uh, looking at uh, the state of Virginia, They've done some great things when it comes to uh, reaching uh, some of their rurals. And so we're going to utilize models like that. There's no sense in reinventing the wheel if we don't have to. Uh, and utilizing some of the great things that they've done there and how they're leveraging their federal government presence. You know, I plan to be directly reaching out to Senator Van Hollen and Senator Cardin, uh, to Congressman Trone and to um, and, and, and to Congressman Raskin and, and all of our uh, congressional, but those are the ones really that I've got the best relationships with to ensure that that money is flowing directly to Montgomery County. Thank you, Councilmember Albernaz. Thank you, Mr. President, and it's good to see you, Mr. Ray. It's gotta be weird sitting in that chair. Um, <laughs> so first, thank you so much for your outstanding public service. You, you are a true servant leader, sir, and like many of us on this dais, I've had the opportunity to work with you for a number of years um, starting when I was at the rec department, when we worked together on the development of the Teen Works program on Excel Beyond the Bell, and your commitment to ensuring that we connect our communities in a myriad of different ways has really been outstanding. And um, your legacy is truly impressive from this dais. So, and, 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 and I am so happy that of your willingness to continue to serve. I supported the development of this position as I stated earlier, because I know how the executive branch works. We do have an incredible team in TEBS that is doing fantastic work and proactively seeking different funding sources, connecting to different departments. But having somebody on what is affectionately known as the second floor that can cross different departments and agencies more nimbly and to then be able to work with the state, work with our federal partners, uh, and connect those also to the college and to MCPS and to our sister county agencies is best done through a position like this directly reporting to uh, the chief administrative officer and county executive. And so it makes sense. And for all the reasons that were stated in the development of this position, the time is now for us to take advantage of many of the resources that are on the table, and we don't want to leave those resources on the table. Now, regarding your candidacy, you couldn't be a more perfect person for this position um, because you are bringing with you relationships that you have been able to establish over a number of years and a keen awareness of both the political but also the regulatory landscape and you are also keenly aware of all of the stakeholders who are involved in this work and you touched on those in the responses to your questions. So I look very much forward to working with you on a myriad of issues but especially as you noted 
um, on ensuring that we address public health uh, equity issues that can be significantly helped with the addition of broadband technology. And I encourage you um, to follow up with the Mary Center, um, who is doing some outstanding work and groundbreaking work in the telehealth and telemedicine space. Uh, and they have received some federal grants to be able to carry that out. I think the work they are doing can be applied to county clinics, um, but also then be expanded to other clinics that are supported by the county. So uh, I look forward to working with you in this brand new capacity, uh, and thank you again for your public service. Thank you. Councilmember Ludke. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. Rice, thank you for, for coming before us today. And, and, and as you know, you're our second interview of the day. So we've already gone through this once this morning where we've had the opportunity to probe an individual's qualifications and experience, right? And as one of my colleagues noted earlier, and I can't remember who said it, we need to make sure we're using good and appropriate use of tax dollars, right? Uh, that's what taxpayers are expecting of us. And so uh, I, I need to ask questions that are no different than I would ask anyone else based on the review of their background and work experience. And we've already discussed a number of things that require state or federal grant funding. You have not, in fact, held any position in your prior work that required the writing of grants. Is that correct? That's correct. OK. And you have not, in fact, overseen the implementation of any state or federally funded grant programs. Is that correct? That's correct. OK. Um, I noticed in your background prior to your service in the General Assembly and here, of course, on the council, you have uh, worked in sales and, and you worked in management um, with a, a retail service establishment. But uh, you have never worked in an executive agency department. Is that correct? An executive agency, you mean government executive agency? Yes. No. OK. Um, and you talked earlier about your passion, which is undeniable for digital career pathways and education. Um, this particular role is not an education policy role, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, Although I will say this, Councilmember Lukey, mm -hmm. um, you know, when we're talking about digital skills, um, that is something and the importance of broadband and, and digital access. Mm -hmm. Many people don't know. Um, so it is educating people about uh, what they're missing out on. Um, that's really important. I think that the way we signal uh, to our community and those who've been disconnected and left behind is because so many of them don't even realize the fact that they actually don't have uh, these skills and it's keeping them from getting to a better place. Uh, those people who want to be a part of the new e-commerce uh, future don't know and understand what they're missing out on. And so part of that is that education and reaching out to communities and making sure that they realize and understand what's actually out there for them. Right, fair enough, uh, you know, public service type engaging the community in what is or is not available and how to make those connections. Totally understand that. And you raised the digital navigator issue. Um, and, you know, in fact, within the CERV Act, that's something that the local program administrators already had the authority to do. Is that right? I, I, I don't know, as the CERV Act hasn't passed yet. So, I mean, from that standpoint, we, we, we would hope that that would be how it would be structured but I don't even know if it's going to pass and the reality is is even if it doesn't it's something that we leveraging our relationships when it comes to Montgomery County Public Schools and uh, Montgomery College can actually do on our own so it would be mm -hmm. great to have the state support but in reality um, we'll be able to do something like that uh, even without uh, the state leveraging those resources right now I was just trying to clarify that there wasn't the Based on the discussion you had earlier, it made it sound like that you had advocated for an amendment of some kind that would have done that when that's already embodied within the way it is drafted. I, I, I haven't seen the drafting of the bill, so I, I couldn't tell you for sure. I know that in my conversation with the governor, when I mentioned it to him uh, directly, he thought that it was a great idea. So I'm not sure whether it was actually included or not, but I can certainly get back to you and let you know. Thanks. Uh, no further questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Sales. Um, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Mr. Rice, for joining us and for, um, as my colleague said, continuing your um, service, your public service in um, coming before us for this position, uh, this very important position as um, 
We just saw from the GOAT committee the amount that we're spending on cybersecurity to protect our IT infrastructure and now to ensure that our communities are connected um, is a very um, huge undertaking. And so wanted to ask a few follow-up questions. Um, what lessons did you learn from the pandemic uh, that you believe will help you in actualizing the county's vision for building a robust digital infrastructure that serves all of our residents? So <laughs> that's a large question. I'll try and condense it as much as possible. Um, what I learned from the pandemic uh, was that there were so many who were so disadvantaged um, who really were now left even further behind. Uh, and I don't even mean that by access to workforce development uh, or um, when it comes to e-commerce or even education, but just in health just to maintain their healthiness, to be able to apply uh, online, to be able to get access to vaccinations. So many people didn't know how to navigate the, the website to be able to log in to say that this is something that's gonna help to save myself and my family's life. That is what's at stake here. And so when you talk about the importance of this and why this matters, I want people to understand that this is about livelihoods. This is about people making sure that they can actually make a difference in not only their own individual lives, but their family's lives as well. You know, uh, it gets personal. Um, my mother suffered a heart attack. Um, she's had two now. She's watching. So hi, mom. Um, and the first time it was during COVID and it was well reported about uh, what had happened and the challenges that folks faced. Um, she had to do a lot of telemedicine appointments. And fortunately, she lived with me. And so I had the opportunity to help her to be able to set up those systems. Uh, even just the other day, my mother was going for an appointment with one of her hematologists and needed to do a form and couldn't figure out how to do it and navigate it. These are the simple things that we think everybody just knows how to do. That's the digital skills piece that we saw that was exacerbated during COVID that really shined a light on what it is that we need to work on. This is not just about running cables to homes. This is not just about getting a grant from the federal government. This is about making sure that we are making, making every person a part of this new digital transformative society. That is what this is truly about at the end of the day. And you have to have a person who's able to lead with that mindset of being able to say, how do we bring all of these things together? How do we accomplish ensuring um, that nobody has to suffer through being alone and not having that connectivity that we know is going to be so important to their lives? And thank you, Mr. Rice. Just uh, one additional follow-up question. Um, given that there is a sunset that was approved for this role. I wanted to know if um, there's a work plan that um, you will um, be able to show that you'll be able to share with us that incorporates um, all the goals and all the work that you'll be doing across this time too. Council, Council Member Sales, that's a great question and it's certainly my intention that if approved uh, for this position, uh, I'll be working with each and every one of you sitting down meeting uh, to not only first what we need to do is find out where our need is. And so we need to do a comprehensive needs assessment uh, utilizing our school system is one of the largest to be able to garner where some of our greatest needs are using FCC uh, digital mapping when it comes to some of the actual uh, infrastructure needs as well. Bringing all of that together and then working with you in your individual capacities, whether it's at a district level or for particular committees, about all the different things from e-commerce to health, uh, all of the things in between uh, to make sure that we can work together in making this happen. So yes, and then from that, will develop, right? So this is working together. Uh, this is not something that is just going to be, and I've had conversations with uh, Mr. Madalino about this. My relationships with the council are a positive one, and I wanna make sure that that continues and that conversation continues about how we work together to make this happen. This is not just owned by the county executive. We all own this as county residents here that we need to do better when it comes to servicing our community. 
Um, thank you. Um, as Council Member Ludke mentioned, you know, um, this is our second interview, and I'm glad that you know a new council will be working with all of these new entities, these new um, uh, leaders in these positions to advance the initiatives that uh, we so desperately care about. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, just want everyone to be aware of the time. We have three more colleagues Sorry. who want to speak. Uh, next up is Councilmember Stewart. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Ice, for joining us today. I'll I'll be quick. Um, I know you uh, share my passion for regionalism um, and working with our colleagues um, in the region and as you did on uh, NACO around um, the country. So my question is, um, is twofold. One, how do you uh, plan to work uh, cooperatively, but also realize that there's competition for these funds out there? And are there positions like yours in other jurisdictions in the region? Thank you. So thank you, yes. Um, in, in fact, uh, in full disclosure, I was in conversations with the county executive from Baltimore County about the same position, um, doing the same exact role as I'm doing here. But I love my county. Um, and uh, it is one in which I feel uh, that we are uniquely positioned as the largest county in the state of Maryland, but also one of the most diverse from a number of different perspectives, not just when it comes to ethnicity uh, and race, but also when it comes to geographic. Uh, and so from that standpoint, as you heard from Ms. Balcom uh, about some of the challenges that we face, we need to share that information about, and that's why I said and mentioned about what's happening in Virginia, being aware and talking about the great wins that we have and how they accomplish those are incredibly important when it comes down to the end of the day and you're seeking those additional funds, those are things behind the scenes working with those individual decision makers that will help to try and make sure those dollars come home to your county. Uh, and so from that standpoint, uh, I really feel as though it's something that's aligned with the way I've always done business. Uh, you and I have worked together with the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, uh, and I've uh, really focused on some of our needs when it came to food insecurity during the COVID pandemic. That was another thing, but we saw um, additional uh, funding uh, and attention being brought to Montgomery County because of our relationships. And so from that standpoint, I think that that's the, the method and the model that I'll use and uh, being able to leverage relationships while also working with individuals to find out some of those best practices that we might not be utilizing here and make sure that we're also implementing them as well. Thank you. We're going to go down the line. Council Member Katz. Yes, sir, and I heard you the first time about the, the time frame. I heard you Your hearing is very good to that. <laughs> Eventually, it'll sink in with me. Uh, first off, let me just publicly thank Craig Rice for even applying for this job, and I, and I mean that uh, sincerely. Um, this has been a two-step process, and uh, creating the job and then filling the job. Um, and we all have heard, I mean, we can talk about this, that some have said that you were being considered for this job because of friendship. Um, and I have to say that I have said that anybody that knows Craig Rice, and I say it publicly, say it behind your back, uh, anyone that knows Craig Rice would know he would not want this job because of friendship. He would want this job because of relationships. He would want th this job so that he can bring people to a better place. And I know that when we created the job, I mentioned that firsthand how I had seen years ago the bridging of the, di the digital divide and how it was life changing. It was in Emory Grove and when I was at, at that moment um, and how it was life changing and, and how uh, young people who didn't have access for computers or anything, uh, anything else, candidly, um, for access at all, um, how their lives had changed. And I have some, I've had people ask me, if this were not about Craig, if this were not about your buddy Craig, would you want, would you have voted for this position? Let me see very clearly, I would have. This is not necessarily about you. It is now, because you're before us. But this job was not necessarily about Craig Rice. This job was about a topic that this council needed to discuss and that we needed to have the right person at the right time. And let me say that I know of your, of your time on the council that whenever there was a question about this topic, um, I turned to you 
And I can also say that I know Montgomery County and the state of Maryland, and on a national level, many have turned to you. I look forward to voting for you on this, for this job for the important work and proving that you are the best person for this job. You'll prove it time and time again. And for seeing you help so many people get a better situation in life, I know of no one who is more qualified to do this job than a fellow by the name of Craig Rice. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I turn it back. Thank you, Councilmember Katz. Uh, Councilmember Jawando. Thank you, Mr. President, and good to see you, Councilmember Rice. Good to see you. Um, it was nice to hear uh, the the what I hadn't heard in a while. Uh, well, thank you very much, which is I always I always hear you say. Um, and I was at the Ignite Hub yesterday, uh, and we were uh, had the first class of the Community Reform Police Training Act training uh, with the new new MCPD recruits, and I spoke to them in the Ignite Hub. So it was kind of a cool just to be at two new things, relatively new things, doing something that's positive for the county. Um, there was uh, I remembered reading a uh, a Forbes ad. Uh, maybe it was over the summer a few years ago and I just tried to pull it up Said so how high-speed broadband could revolutionize education mm -hmm. uh, as one former lead for libraries and now chair of education committee to a, a former at lead for libraries and chair of education committee um, I cannot underscore enough how important it is you know with this money that's out there uh, to uh, take advantage of every avenue uh, to make sure we utilize it not just for our students but for health care uh, job training all of the issues that you mentioned earlier um, and it's going to take deliberate speed it's going to take understanding in the interconnectivity of this world it's going to take relationships um, and uh, yes you know some grant writing will help but there's some good grant writers over at the uh, across the street I've seen them I've met them um, but you are uniquely qualified to help us leverage this unique moment in time uh, in, uh, in our country and in our county. Um, and it's needed now more than ever. Uh, we, have, we see the scores for our students. We know the disparities were exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, connectivity will be key uh, to keeping parents, families, students engaged, connected, and caught up. Uh, we, are, we are literally to going to be talking about in the education committee tutoring dollars that a large portion of them go towards uh, online tutoring right you can't do online tutoring if you're not connected so uh, I know you understand that as one of the many in interconnected points here uh, and I want to echo the comments of many of my colleagues but particularly my crying buddy Councilmember Katz <laughs> <laughs> to, <Is it> <laughs> yeah. to say that you are uniquely qualified for this role. I was proud to vote to support it. I would have done it whether it was you or not, and I'm proud to vote for you today. Uh, so thank you for putting yourself forward and no comment necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you very much, you. Uh, Mr. Rice, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, this It is a, uh, it is afternoon. Uh, it's been a long morning. Um, and for uh, bringing your, your full self uh, and your knowledge and your skills and your passion for this position, uh, we will uh, deliberate and get back to you very shortly. And thank you, Mr. Madalino, as well. Thank you. Um, and so, colleagues, given the time, uh, we are going to postpone uh, the consent calendar. And we are going to go right next to a meeting that we have with the Montgomery County Retired Employees Association, which is taking place on the fourth floor Capitol Crescent Trail Conference Room. Uh, and then we will reconvene at 1.30. So with that, we are in recess.